Good morning and welcome to the summer session regular meeting of the school committee. If everybody would please rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So thank you. We have a, a packed agenda, as we often do in the summer, trying to get through a lot of business today. Uh, we will start with our first opportunity for public comment, and then we will move into reports to the school committee. We will have a superintendent's report, the school committee chair report, as well as any liaison reports that people have. We will have a review of the group norms and uh, uh, update. It, we're looking at the norms that are in the packet that are from last year. We typically would recreate those, and we then We'll look at them to vote a new set of norms for next the next meeting. We then have new business. We have a fall production advisor request from Mr. Keller, a writing club advisory request from Mr. Keller, Hopkinton Middle School New York City trip request also from Mr. Keller, a request for a transfer of a 0.4 full-time employment position from Mr. Keller, a presentation from Mr. Ghosh on the Hopkinton Public School website refresh, the lease of Apple computer equipment for the one-to-one -one laptop program by Ms. Rothermick, the school bus parking lot bids also by Ms. Rothermick, the elementary library position full-time employee by Dr. Kavanaugh, vacation time 12-month secretarial staff request by Dr. Kavanaugh, policy review discussion by Dr. Kavanaugh, culture and diversity survey presentation by Dr. Kavanaugh, discussion on future agenda items by me, and then we will move into old business to have a discussion of school committee policy BIA, new school committee member orientation for a third meeting by Ms. Barath. Then we will have a second opportunity for public comment and we will move into items by consensus before we have our attorney, uh, attorney Michelle McNulty coming to review open meeting law, social media use, conflict of interest, state ethics guidelines, and other relevant legal guidelines. This is an opportunity for us to get questions answered as well as for her, uh, her to have a dialogue with us. And then we will look to adjourn sometime this afternoon. And then our next meeting will be on August 13th. Uh, I believe we had discussed trying to move that to 10 a.m. because everybody couldn't do 9 a.m. So with that, um, seeing no members of the public, unless somebody wanted to speak on behalf of the public, we will go on to um, reports. Okay. So I actually have quite a few things. Um, I'm not sure if the entire committee is aware, but during kindergarten screening, um, there was an issue where parents were alerted to the fact that in the budget process, we had gone from um, having a paraprofessional in every single kindergarten teacher's classroom to a situation where there would be one paraprofessional to each two kindergarten teacher's classrooms. And you know, we had talked a little bit about there being bathrooms in the classroom, that sort of thing. But somehow in kindergarten screening, um, the information was conveyed, and I'm not sure that parents um, had a clear idea of what was really happening there. So Lauren DeBeau and I received several calls about that. Um, to be very proactive, Jen and I met with all the kindergarten teachers yesterday in this room, and I think that our meeting was excellent, really. I don't think we could have hoped for better outcomes. Uh, so a couple of the things that we have agreed to with the kindergarten teachers to sort of ease that transition, moving from uh, a one-to-one -one para situation to a two-to-one para situation, and we have decided that um, prior to the start of the school year, Lauren DeBeau, Jen, and I will meet with the kindergarten staff so that we can decide how to best deploy our resources. So for example, if on the first day of school, kids aren't actually um, being pulled out for special education services, we can have special educators working with us. We are also looking at recruiting parents so that um, we might be able to get some assistance with things like lunch, recess, arrival, dismissal, especially in the beginning because when we were dealing with kids who are five and six years old, you know, it's very difficult for them to acclimate to routines and even our first graders are going to have difficulty with some of the routines because they knew them in center, they don't know them in marathon. Uh, we talked about the uniqueness of Marathon Elementary as an early childhood learning center because when you do have neighborhood schools where there are K-5 to five, um, buildings, often you have you know, maybe four kindergarten classrooms or two kindergarten classrooms. For us, we have 13 kindergarten classrooms and we may actually be looking at a fourth, a 14th, and that's just because the population is growing by leaps and bounds right now. Uh, so if we have 
criers on the first day of school or if we have kids who you know just can't sort of self-regulate if you had two of those in every classroom it means we have 26 dysregulated children as opposed to in a smaller school you know four dysregulated or six dysregulated kids so we'll be looking at contingency plans for what we will do with kids who are dysregulated in those first couple of weeks of school um, what we are hoping is that we can have quarterly meetings with the kindergarten team to see how things are going with the reduction in paraprofessionals and we agreed that they would be keeping data on you know, instructional time and the kinds of commitments that they're making to single learners as opposed to the whole group. So, you know, just in terms of resources, guidance counselors, and, you know, everybody all hands on deck in those first few days of school and, you know, Jen and I plan to be there as well. So we are hoping for a very smooth opening and transition into Marathon Elementary and we are hoping to work really proactively with the kindergarten teachers. Um, Dr. Kern, I'm just wondering, you know, when you talk about the dysregulated kids and the challenges that come along with it, um, have you all thought of possibly reaching out for any parent volunteers at all? Yes, so that was one of the, the ideas. We were trying to get parents, and we would like to have an opportunity to train them before the start of school. So that, you know, that training will involve what does the lunchroom look like, you know, what kinds of things will we need you to do. You know, having been in an elementary school, you know, you don't realize it maybe as a parent, but when you've got 250 kids who all need help, you know, taking the cellophane off of a straw, right? Like that happens, opening a package of, you know, something, right? So uh, those things are, are things that, I mean, they seem simplistic, but you know, if we train our parents, we should be able to work through lunch and recess and arrival and dismissal and even you know, some of those things like there's a student who's not feeling well, is there someone I can call who can escort that kid to the nurse's office so that you know, we don't have kind of chaos. So we're really hoping that parent volunteers will be able to help us at least initially. Mm -hmm. and, and Dr. Connell, will you email the parents, the families of these kindergartners and first graders to see if they want to? Yes, oh, Lauren's on vacation this week, okay. but when she comes back, we'll take a look at how to reach yeah. out to them, recruit them, bring them in and train them. That's great. Yes, we're excited about that. So I felt like it was a very good meeting yesterday. Yeah, it was. Yeah. That's great. Uh, let's see. We have already had our first day of administrative retreat. Um, I felt like we got an awful lot accomplished. We did some work around the teacher evaluation process. We did some work around the survey that you'll see in our meeting later today. And the admin retreat will continue on August 14th and 15th at the Warren Conference Center. So we have full days planned for all of the administrators. Typically, we are a group of about 20 people. Uh, Karen Zaleski and I have been working with Tech, and one of the things that they are offering this year uh, for $5,000, interested member districts can um, engage in some work around safety and security. And it really is um, the kind of work that doesn't think about you know, bulletproof glass or metal detectors, but more around that sort of social, emotional, behavioral, psychological, how do you know when you have children who have, you know, additional needs that may cause them to become, you know, angry, dysregulated, fringy, outliers, or whatever. Um, there are five sessions, you bring five people along, and the five people become sort of your core group. And so we are very much looking forward to embarking on that. Uh, typically, you'll bring in people who are you know, principals, assistant principals, therapists, guidance counselors, that, that kind of group of people. So we will be looking at that with tech this year. And my last thing is my own goals. So you know that I will be presenting them to you for your approval, and I'm hoping to um, get those to you in early August so that we can look at them on the August 13th meeting. Okay. And that's all I have. Okay. Um, I, does anybody have any liaison reports they want to give before I go into it? Yeah, it's a little quieter with a lot of the outside boards. So mm -hmm. that be. Um, yeah, I've looked at the agenda and I've thought about it, uh, but I think it's okay. Okay. So I will start out by saying uh, that I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrants 18-086, 18-090, 18-091, 18-092, 18-093, Eighteen dash zero nine one and eighteen dash zero nine two. The packets have been included in your packet. I have also approved for payment the payroll warrants S one nine zero zero one and S one eight balance. All warrants have also been included in your packet. 
And then at the June 28, 2018 executive session of the school committee, the school committee met to comply with and act under the authority of Mass General Laws specific to the review of executive session minutes. The school committee voted to release the minutes of February 7, 2017, March 16, 2017, April 25, 2013, and October 15, 2015. The school committee voted not to release the executive minutes of August 16, 2011, May 17, 2018, and June 7, 2018. The school committee voted to release the executive minutes of July 9, 2014 as redacted. Additionally, um, I received some communication, which I believe people were also copied on to have that I just wanted to report back, that I received three emails and one phone call uh, that I received this morning re regarding uh, the survey and the desire for the community to have some input um, into our diversity discussions going forward. And I do, I know that there was some diversity conversation that happened that did include um, the, the HDC I was invited to go to in Framingham. Uh, and that the diversity initiatives we have are going to be a long process. It is not a one-off over the summer. And that I am looking forward to hearing more from Dr. Kavanaugh regarding the survey, and we can kind of just leave that piece of it until then. Uh, I did respond to the email I received last night, and I will respond uh, again this morning to the ones I received today. Uh, the other email I received regarding the use of electronic devices like our laptops here and there was concern based on our norms because it does say in the norms that we adopted last year that use of electronic devices must be in support of the meeting and I, I had never thought of it this way but it was interpreted to mean that we were using, I believe that we were using them to solicit public opinion which of course is a violation of open meeting law. It, the, when we discussed last year, and you can, people who are at the meeting can certainly step in to correct me, but the discussion we had was that if you pulled up your agenda packet, for example, on your computer, that's certainly an appropriate use or using materials that relate to the meeting, but not communicating with people outside the meeting uh, and not you know, surfing Facebook or not doing things unrelated that our attention is expected always to be here in the meeting. So that was, I did respond to that as well. That is accurate. Nancy. Thank you. Uh, but it also, I think, as we go into the discussion on norms, to be aware that sometimes the way it makes sense to us is not conveyed the same as what we're reading into it so that people are aware of it. The other thing I had is I've had been in conversation with the Holliston School Committee Chair, uh, and the reason I have been in communication with her is because <coughs> Holliston puts out a newsletter, their school committee does, that I am very interested in us pursuing. So I was having a conversation with her, uh, and they do it as an entire school committee to find out a little bit about uh, how they managed to do it within, because we still always have to operate with an open meeting law. And it was a very fruitful conversation that they, one thing that they do, and we could consider if we want to go this route, uh, is they submit things that they're going to want to include in the newsletter into the packet, and then they edit it as a whole in the meeting, and then it can go out like that. And I have heard from parents in Holliston that that is a a valued tool and I think when we move to that if we move to that level we should also look at ways that we're getting it out uh, I had thought I know later when our attorney comes we'll be talking about the use of social media we could possibly talk about setting up a social media account that is specific to the school committee the district does have their own um, but it if we had one specific to the school committee it could get shares along around Facebook just related to our specific things uh, but that's Still in the infancy, but it would be nice to be able to have a conversation and have it on the agenda perhaps next month to figure out how we want to go forward. I think it's a fantastic idea and a great initiative, Nancy. And I must say, I also appreciate you getting each cam here and, of course, each cam to I, today. So I, I think the, I, what I have heard from people uh, in our meetings and uh, what I've heard from people in the public is the transparency is a really important and vital issue to us. And I think it's important to us to bring people to, to us, but also to meet them where they're at. And I look forward to when we go out into the community for our school committee hours and what we're able to gain from the community that way. So I do feel like we have traction on our own things and to work in conjunction with administrators and the system. So I feel like we are ready to launch, we will be ready to launch a positive and productive year. Okay. That moves us into the group norms uh, annual update. Okay.
So I did put copies, hard copies of the new arms on the table. And I just did that because for me personally, I kind of like to have a hard copy. Uh, what you see on this sheet is uh, the 2017 version of it that was voted on last August. And um, it is our charge this morning to take a look at these and to decide which ones we think are, are worthy of keeping, which anything that we might like to revise or anything that we may like to add to our norms. Um, so I guess I would invite you at this point to just kind of take a minute to read through them and, and see what you think. So just to be clear in terms of the norms, you know, when, and we saw this last year, this seems to guide how we conduct amongst ourselves and with the administration. Um, it, I don't see it showing much in terms of our communication with the community, which is also part of our work. So I was wondering if we can add something to that effect in here. Um, that was one thing. Um, the other one, and I know I'm going to be presenting it further down about welcoming the, uh, you know, the new member orientation, but I feel in terms of how we conduct ourselves towards uh, amongst the school committee members. Uh, this is something I proposed last time too, I'm just trying it out again, is uh, welcoming new school committee members. So many times I feel that, uh, you know, when the system is functioning, we're all in it and we're going about our business, but when a new member comes in, they have to pretty much insert themselves into the processes. So if we can somehow open ourselves up a little bit more to reach them and bring them in, um, that would be great, I think. Uh, you'll see that come out in the orientation too, that could we be more welcoming or use something around, um, some verbiage around that to say we support the onboarding of new school committee members. Not that we're not doing it, uh, but in terms of norms, that is another thought. I had a thought too. You know how when you read a book, you sometimes open the book to an epigraph, which acts as a map for what's to follow. Um, art is the sedimented history of human misery by Adorno, so you know that it's going to be a pretty bleak tale ahead of you. I thought that we needed to have some kind of statement here to give us a little more guidance at the outset, because the word student doesn't appear here. And I thought, isn't our primary objective to improve student achievement. And perhaps that could be our epigraph or our guiding star. Um, because it's very focused on the internal maneuvers of the committee, which is great, but I think let's just open our, our lens a little bit wider, that the real reason why we're here is to help each kid improve and achieve as much as they can. And everything else is in obedience to that. I think, I think in terms of the philosophy, and I completely agree with what you're saying, is that in terms of our goals uh, as a school committee, that's, you know, we've been through the MSc training and what have you. As uh, school committee members and administration, I, I think that's our number one goal, the kids. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just wondering, is that something we define more in the philosophy um, and kind of trying to say what we do? How do we build that into the norms of how we conduct ourselves? It seems like this is a guideline on how we conduct business. Um, so I, I'm wondering how we put that word, those words in. Maybe just at the, at the beginning, beginning, the primary objective of the school committee mm -hmm. is to improve student achievement. Mm -hmm. Our meetings will therefore be guided by the following norms in service of that objective. We can tweak the wording, of course. I will say, because I did in preparation for this meeting, I did look at a couple of other districts, and there are some that do include that at the beginning. I'm looking at um, Barrington, for example. Their yeah. first norm on there is, remember always that our first and greatest concern must be the educational welfare of all in bold, uh, all students attending the public schools. I think that that's a very good thing to say. All students right. must attend public school. That's a great goal to have. 
Well, it doesn't say that all students must all attendance who are attending, not, oh. not that they all must attend. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was thinking, I'm not getting in the way of parent choice. I was thinking, wouldn't it be yeah. fantastic if, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so if, if I may, I, I just would like to read it some of these out loud yeah. and I apologize I did not have them in advance enough to get them to the packet but just to look at there are things that we could include or not include in what we do but that other districts do it similar but differently. The, the Barrington's number two is exercise leadership in vision planning, policy making, evaluation and advocacy on behalf of the students and district not in managing the day-to-day -day operation of the district and I, I think that probably comes from differentiating out our kind of upper our view from the 10,000 feet so to speak versus the day-to-day -day operations that the district tends to have their business in. Mm -hmm. Not that you guys don't look at the larger view too, I didn't mean to say that. Conduct our business through a set agenda. Emerging items will be addressed in subsequent meetings through agenda items. Render all decisions based on the available facts and independent judgment and refuse to surrender that judgment to individuals or special interest groups. Engage in critical thinking, expecting all committee members to freely offer differing points of view as part of the discussion prior to making a board decision. Committee members will work together to clarify and restate discussions in order to strive for full understanding. Mm -hmm. Attend meetings well prepared to discuss issues on the agenda and will be prepared to make decisions striving for efficient decision making. Strive to provide all committee members and the superintendent with current information relevant to the committee duties and responsibilities. Strive to reach decisions by consensus. Discuss with respect, disagree without acrimony. When consensus is not possible, all members will publicly abide by the majority decision. Understand and respect the chain of command. While the committee is eager to listen to its constituents and staff, each inquiry is to be directed to the superintendent and his or her de designee. Abide by the practice that all public statements regarding school committee actions or decisions will be communicated through the chairperson or his or her designee. Remain informed about current educational issues through individual study and participation in programs providing relevant information. Take no private action that will compromise the school committee or administration and respect the confidentiality of information that is privileged under applicable law. Annual review and revise our standards and norms as needed as part of the committee's self-evaluation. So some of those I think are differently worded for some of what we already have, but, and some of them maybe aren't what we want, but just wanted to highlight somebody else's work. I also wonder about the title of this document. Is it limited really to our agreed upon norms for communication or yeah. is it something That's else? Yeah, Neshoba has operating protocol as it's titled. It's kind of a vanilla term, but it fits the bill. Right, so I guess uh, in, in my view, um, what we were trying to do with the school committee website is kind of try to talk about what we do and so we were thinking of bringing the policy around philosophy and um, there was another one um, uh, along those lines around code of conduct or somehow which ethics. talks ethics. Ethics. so so talk more in terms of our views on you know we talked about it probably the last meeting or the pre meeting before that student achievement budget policy um, etc and talking to the community it's part of our um, you know goals and how we want to respond to that so I just want to know if we want to bring some of that <coughs> in here uh, and if that's what we are talking about, from what I heard from, you know, just to uh, take it up a level, you're talking about how we conduct business when we sit, you know, the ones that right. you read, right? Yes. So it's uh, around how we do the school committee meetings, so come, being well prepared, asking questions of the superintendent and the administration a little ahead of time so that they're better prepared. You know, so, so it's more around doing business as a, in the meeting, right? So that's one category, if you will. Um, and the second one, I think, was more around the philosophy, if you will. Right? Those seem like the two categories. Would you say that a category of how we communicate with the community, I think there was one around, if anything comes from the community, we direct it to the superintendent. Something, something to that effect existed. In our current, uh, in, in this actually was raised on a phone call, and 
that I had this morning. The it's school committee, is this what you're talking about, number five, school committee members agree to channel requests for information from teachers, principals, or members of the community through the superintendent? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're? Um, not that one. Okay. I think when you were reading some, Nancy. So again, I'm trying to categorize. Can I guess there is this whole philosophy concept. Yep, that's a good. Sorry, say that again. I'm going to send can you a copy of this projected? so we can. Oh, that'd be great. Absolutely. Yeah. Um. And we can put it up on the screen, and yeah. everyone can everyone see can it. Everyone can look yeah. at it. That's, that's a good fantastic. I will take the laundry challenge. challenge so. um, you can let me if know. If I just send it to you, can you get it? Yes, okay. okay. Yeah, then that I'm the projector, projector right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I just sent you the link. Yeah, okay. I always get nervous when I just get links from people, so that this one is legit. <laughs> <laughs> Nancy, I'm just, um, just through the chair for everyone. Um, so again, just trying to categorize. I yes. see it in four categories. One is to add that verbiage around philosophy, right? That our focus is on the students, etc. trying to bring that in. Um, the second is how we conduct business as a school committee, the meeting being prepared so that the flow of the meeting is smooth and everyone is um, has get, gotten an opportunity to be prepared and present. Um, with material. The third is communication with the community members, mm -hmm. right? That if they bring an issue to us, yes, to us individually, what are we supposed to do, right? And the third one, I think, is more communication amongst each other outside of the school committee meetings. If we can speak a little bit to that, whether it is onboarding of the new school committee members, whether it is respecting open meeting laws, ethics, what have you, I, I think something around that. So I'm thinking That's, these four yes. categories and then go from there, the detailed line by line items. Does that make sense? So Anything I can, else? I guess we're, I'm wrestling right now with the relationship between norms of engagement yes. and policy. Thank you. Yes, yes. because yes. the yes. policy Agreed. subcommittee has been uh, meeting, which we'll talk about later. But um, there, there is a lot in the policy documents which are, which address things like student achievement and ethics. There are all sorts of policies that don't really change on a day-to-day -day basis. These are policies right. that govern school committee. You know, until we redefine what school committee is, sure. it's sort of they're sure. longer lasting. So they sit at a, at a policy level. Yes. Under many of our policies, we have procedures and forms and other types of things that do reflect the changing times, the groups, the, the, the norms that might change like annually or every two, three years. Or, right. So I'm wondering how these things intersect. Um, because I think um, I completely agree that student achievement and that, that objective should be articulated. I'm not sure where. Um, I totally agree that engagement with the public, like to communication norms and responsibilities and protocols and hierarchies are also important and right. they don't change that often. So I feel like those are more policy. So I'm, I'm just kind yes. of sitting in the state of confusion a little bit here. That's, uh, I think, great to bring that back to focus because the, this, what we're doing right now, we update annually. Yeah. And it, it is because the school committee changes annually that um, it, and I'm assuming the five of us won't be the same committee that's sitting here in 10 years. Um, it, but the policies, many of them will last many, many mm -hmm. years. And that the policy is also something that is transparent and more searchable, more easily accessible, that the public understands how to find them better. Yeah. So things like looking at an ethics policy, other policies, I, I, don't, I don't want to jump ahead because I don't know exactly what you guys are pre presenting for yeah. what you're your plan for the year is, but we never want to supersede policy. We want policy to be, this to be under policy, more to be about how we do business. Yeah. I, I don't think that excludes the ability to put a statement in just about, but I, I, to speak to your point, I think we do want to be careful not to overstep into policy. Well, I, I totally could see this as a document that is numbered or lettered and hangs under about one or more policies because I think it does these norms when we come to whatever they are do support how our day-to-day -day reflects the policy so I think 
in many cases we hang like you know whatever crazy numbering scheme the policy might have JRAQ or whatever we might have a dash one or a dash two documents in support of the policy that govern the day to day. So I'd, I'd love to, at the end of when we're all done, like link them if we can. I think that's a fantastic idea. And I have to agree with um, Nancy that there's nothing stopping us from bringing some of that because that's the yeah. lens. That's what you were trying to say, Meg, that we need to yeah. keep that lens always that where is our number one focus when we're conducting business and that's where our focus is. Yeah. So I think it's okay to have some verbiage. I don't think we're going to lift all of it. That was my first thought too, that isn't that in philosophy? Uh, but I think we can bring some of it yeah. in here. And right. I really like your choice, Nancy, of the Barrington Public Schools, because I looked at several too. But this first line speaks to that objective. Right. right. Keep the students. Right. At, at the forefront of our thinking and all of the decisions we make concerning budget and policy and then the rest fall under that. And I like educational welfare as opposed to achievement. I do too. Thank mm -hmm. you so much, Dr. Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. Achievement is such an overused word. Mm -hmm. It is. And it's much more. Educational yeah. welfare is much more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a very good point. So that is something maybe we could put steal. in to, to steal, to yes. work towards the document that, mm -hmm. they, again, mm -hmm. we don't have to, we, we don't, we're not looking to approve this till next month, but yeah. we're looking to have a better shape, make it have some more to it. Right. I don't right. like the word steal, I like the word inspire. I, I like that steal. better too. <laughs> <laughs> I like the word copy and paste as number one. <laughs> and then let's just go from there. This <laughs> is plagiarism, but you know, plagiarism is a tribute. We are paying tribute to Barrington. As, as, no, no. as long as it's acknowledged, as long as it's acknowledged, right? Then, then that's fine. Well, poets don't often acknowledge. Uh, we have no idea how many districts are copying and pasting from what we do either. Right. It, yeah. it is common practice, I'm sure, mm -hmm. in other mm -hmm. school committees do as well. Sure, we have a policy subgroup. We are not afraid. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe we just added at the bottom that inspired by Barrington Public Schools and whoever, whoever. If, if it, you know, Stop that's our yeah. If we feel like we just like ourselves. Yeah, sure. I, I think it's also too at the very top of our, um, our document, it says in order to ensure committee meetings are effective and efficient, and that is really, I think, the whole point of these norms. Yes. It's not necessarily about the communication that happens prior to or after the meetings, even though that's important. These are just about how to keep the meetings effective and efficient. And so if we want to eliminate that and add in all the other things, fine. But I feel like those, as you have already both stated, those are potential um, policies that we've been looking into that I'm going to tell you about later on. But, but I think these sort of set of operating norms are, you know, the reason that they're here is because they're not common sense, but they should be. Right. And so right. they really are, you know, be nice, be respectful, come prepared, and be thoughtful with your responses. And that's sort of the end of the story. Here are the seven things that are written as our norms, and all of these norms, if you want, I, I like adding, I like plagiarizing Barrington and, and adding that number one in there, and then, you know, go from there. So I think, um, you know, I'm, I, like, I like the philosophy and the ethics piece to be more of a policy because that's more set in stone mm -hmm. and then this is just conduct meetings in a manner that will keep us productive and moving in the right direction. I, I can see your point entirely and yet I'm nervous about using terms like effective and efficient at the beginning of a document because it seems like that's our ultimate goal rather than the welfare of students and, and whose measure of effectiveness and efficiency and efficacy I mean, that's a scene too. Sure. Sure. Raise good points, although I do fully expect that the public will let us know when we are being inefficient. <laughs> that, really, <laughs> that really is our and I, yeah. I, I, I do as well. I, I, Chair I, Absolutely. I, uh, I think that makes us better people and better as a committee when we get the feedback from what people Absolutely. are hearing. Exactly. Because it, what they hear and what they see is not always what we intend to project. And, and I fear that there might be a public perception that efficiency has betrayed transparency in, in the past. Right. And, and so moving forward, we don't want efficiency to be the goal as much as we do transparency. Uh, we could also put transparency in there someplace yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Would be. 
I, I do think we want to strive to make the meetings effective um, as much as I love chatting with everybody and hanging around. Um, but effective by whose to measure? We need to just add or allow, if you want to use that term. So Nancy, one thing I do want to talk about is, um, I think in, in this you had talked about when something comes from the community, or maybe it was ours right here, is to channel requests. So while we want to channel requests in there, I think, you know, we, and with all the measures you're also trying to put in place, it is our job to listen to the community Absolutely. members. And we are here to hear them, but we want to make sure that to get it resolved, the necessary steps are taken, um, have been taken. I uh, agree entirely. Uh, and the other thing that, it, and I wanted to come back to this also because it was raised in a question this morning um, with a phone call I had. This does not at all preclude us from having conversations from, with people, and I would encourage us to have conversations with people. It really is more about us channeling requests directly through the superintendent rather than saying, you know, a particular parent comes to us and says, gee, my kid's having a lot of trouble in foreign language. This teacher is, you know, or math or whatever the subject may be. Right. This te teacher's giving my kid a hard time. Rather than us saying, jumping in and saying, oh, let me take care of that, uh, to point them to the chain of command the, the, uh, for problem resolution. Mm -hmm. And for us, we shouldn't be going to teachers. We should be anything that we want to talk with about staff should be channeled through the superintendent because there's a perception when we ask people who work in the district. It's not just a question in that way that it's not just a parent to parent, but it's always the school committee hat they're looking at. And then it becomes, what are they looking for? And we don't fit in the box of how they resolve their own issues. We're not part of the personnel chain. So that, that would, and that certainly is something we have done in other years. I don't know if there's other that you would want to add to the way that we bring things to the superintendent, but. No, I, I think I would just add um, that it is really important that any of those kinds of concerns probably goes to, you know, you and then to me. Right. And then, you know, I will contact the appropriate people within the schools, have conversations with teachers, principals, and, um, you know, in 99% of our cases, what we say when a parent has an issue with a teacher is, contact the teacher, you know, and I know that that's difficult for parents, but hierarchically that's the way we've always operated. So. And I'm just wondering if a community member reaches one of us over a random topic. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Sure. Um, how do we escalate that up? Right. How do we bring it back to the committee and, you know, maybe something around that that if there is um, something non-student specific that comes up. Sure. Something so, okay. that's part of our beeswax. Exactly. That is. Mm -hmm. it, and that's an excellent question, I think, in particular, because if we're looking to do school committee hours, we can only ever have two of us there without it being an open meeting. Right. Uh, and it not being an open meeting allows flexibility for people to come and discuss whatever the issue is they want to discuss. If we all five were there, we'd have to stick to an agenda. So it's, yeah. it's better for them to have two of us. And we had a little bit of a conversation on this. I think we then still run into open meeting law if, say, Nina and I are holding school committee office hours one month and we have a couple of parents come with a, an issue that really is the school committee's business and want some resolution. I can't reach out to Meg and say, you know, gee, what do you think about this? This is what the parents said because then we're having a serial conversation. Right. But what we can do is report back here in the open meeting and say, I had, you know, a parent come, and some people may want to be identified, some people maybe don't. Uh, that I think would be important to check before ever identifying somebody in the meeting. Right. A parent who came and identified this as an issue would like the school committee to weigh in on this, or just even to bring it, bubble it back up that there's concern about something that we need to take action on or we need to be aware of so that all five of us are on, operating the same set of facts. Right. Is this something that, that we can, whoever um, staffed the yes. office hours, can bring forward during the public comment section or as a standing agenda I, item? It, it, it has to be a standing agenda item, I think. We, I mean, can't, it, it we can't bring be. it forward. Like, as today you said, is, and do any of us have it? Yes. I, 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 well, I think when you come comment? forward as part of the public comment, you're speaking just on behalf of your, your personal issues rather than school committee. Okay. When you have something that's on behalf of school committee business, it yeah. would be, and because if we bring it as a school committee 
agenda item, it allows more conversation than just right. a public comment. So can we have like a standing? Yes, yeah. that, that should absolutely, it would be my opinion. And I think we can discuss once we set up a date, how we want that to, how we want it to look when we have the actual, I've gone way off this topic here, sorry. <laughs> um, how we want this to look and how we want it to be reported back. Yep. But I do want to try to, because we have limited time before Michelle comes to. Yes. To pass that back to you. Well, it does raise but, the yeah. question of norms and goes back to what Nina was saying about the different buckets of norms. Right. And um, if we are introducing um, office hours, right. which we all are think is a great idea, we probably need norms around that. I mean, you just said we in do, your, we you need some parenthetical comments in your yeah. comments. Well, we probably don't want to check the identity right. of the person. We probably I, want to yes. do this. Those are norms, so we probably want to come back. So to for that, 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 that I would think would be a great August agenda item in and of itself, separate from these norms, would be how we conduct office hours and how we report back, so that it could be reported back. Uh, okay. After we have that meeting. I think that's fine. It, it, to me, it seems more like a very detailed procedure around it based on what you're saying for office hours specifically. But I think, again, adding some verbiage that will make ourselves available to the community through in, various in means, document. right? It, 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 through holding office hours or being proactive by sharing a newsletter or things of that nature, we can decide. And like you said, we review it every year. Uh, Right. Next year, we might think differently. Well, I, a little yeah. differently. We, or we might build on what we've, we've yes. done this year. Yes. That, that is my hope, is that the new things we bring forward will be wild successes in one way. Absolutely. I, I choose to follow the path of hope. Yes. I do too. Absolutely. So, just to be a little bit concrete, what I'm hearing Mina and you say is you would like to see a sentence in there about how we, how we want to engage with the community. That's right. So I think those four categories that we talked about, one was adding something around student engagement. The second is around how we conduct business, which is what is the primary goal here, it looks like, of the current norms. The school committee, how do we function the school in the context of the school committee meetings. And then um, the third being how we communicate with the community and channel that conversation. I think there was a fourth. Philosophy, no. I think. I'm no. the first, and oh, then sorry, the school committee. No, I'm you, the community, you said, no, but community communication with the community, communication with each other, how we conduct yes. business and philosophy. Yes, and these are each three, four separate documents. You think? No, I'm Sentences, thinking. I think. All of some them. bullets okay. around it. Each okay. one may have one, two, three bullets. Hopefully, not more than that. You don't want more than twelve norms. Right. I think. And yeah, then, and I think this know. is really about how we do business sort of in right. this setting, right? right? I mean, most of it will be how we do business within this setting. Which is why I was thinking those things you said, you know, how we conduct business during and bring information back outside of the committee is separate. It's its, a, it's own set of norms. How we, our philosophy and our ethics and that, that is separate. It's our, It's its own set of norms. And then what we do in the three or four or five or six or seven hours that we're all together talking with each other and communicating with each other is its own set of yeah. norms. Um, so how we bring that information back, I mean, school committee members agree to channel requests for information from teachers, principals, or members of the community through the superintendent. We could have a separate sentence saying, um, there will be an agenda item for any outside communication from community members, period. See, for me, what this is trying to, when I re read this particular sentence, it seems like we want to channel everything to the superintendent. I think we need to make it clear that we do want to listen to the community members and we are available to them. However, there are boundaries. You know, in order to function well, we need to channel it through the teacher, the principal, or whatever is the chain of command. Um, and we'll have to do that. But then there will be some items like a community member talked about uh, school uniforms. So how do we bring that forward? Could we add that sentence, you know, the agenda item for outside communication from community members so to report um, based on, you know, I mean, I, we don't even need a lot of notes based on anything. It doesn't have to be in there. Just say, you know, every, every meeting will have an opportunity for members to comment on communications they receive from the community. 
I think all I'm thinking is be open to listening to the community voice in terms of norms, right? And then we have uh, means set up for it through the office hours or through newsletters or make sure that we have, we make ourselves available to the community. To me, that seems more, does that make oh, sense? I agree with you. I totally agree with you. I just think that, that these norms are only for what happens here. And so I, I agree. We need to have a mechanism in place to do what you want to do. Oh, I thought that we said that we will make this a little bit more than just the this meeting. I thought we said we're doing all four, a little bit of all four. No? I mean, we are going to have those policies, but we said there will be some of those items that will creep in here. Am I mistaken? So are you suggesting that, so say the committee decides that as a practice, you'll hold office hours. Right. Do you feel like those belong in these norms? No. Right, I agree. I, I, for me, this document is something that says, how do we sort of operate, how do we do business exactly. when we are conducting business? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and some of the philosophy around it. So this is kind of our guiding principles on communicating amongst each other, conducting a formal business as we do with the, with the school committee meetings, how we communicate with the community, and as we said, a little bit of the philosophy. So that's how I'm thinking of it, that a little bit of things from the policies will creep in, but this is not going to be the be all of that procedure document that Nancy is going to put together. Going around and around it's like. Right. I feel like as school committee members, when you communicate with people on the outside, there may be the person, like Nancy said, who says, I'm having a very difficult time with my child's teacher, right? right? That's very different from a person who says, you know, I, I think everybody, uh, we should move to a situation where all of our kids start wearing school uniforms, right? right? right. School uniforms might be something for the whole committee to take a look at and, right. you know, do some kind of study on. Right. The problem with your own child's teacher is go to the teacher. That's right. right. That's right. But I don't know that that information needs to be part of our norms. No, I don't think so okay. either. What I'm saying is I we need to have a norm as a committee. I think we already do this. Make ourselves available to the community to listen to their concerns. To me, that's the norm. Okay. I see what you're right saying. There. It's a Simple. value statement. Yeah, that, yeah. That's so right. right. It's a value statement. Make ourselves yeah. available to, I'm looking for a better word than meet. I'm looking at you because you're going to words. Um, Talk to me a little bit more about what you want to say. I, I want to capture a little bit about what Mina said, that we want to make ourselves, what I'm hearing people say, not just, I'm not speaking for everybody, but ways that we can make ourselves available to hear from the community and bring it back. Available to the concerns of the community. We want to make ourselves available to the concerns. Accessible. Accessible. Well, you guys represent the voice of the, the community. The voice, right. Mm -hmm. we yeah. And that's, that's oh, exactly like that. what I think is, we, I, I actually like putting that in there. We represent Please. the voice of the community, yeah. and as such, we will make ourselves available. I think so. To listen. To listen. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 is fantastic. Quick, write it down before you forget. Prolong the discussion, though it's been a very fruitful one, and I admire the, the contours of your thinking very much, but I, I don't think that these are necessarily discrete categories. I think philosophy infuses everything we do. Um, no, I, I understand that. It, there is overarching. I'm, I was talking about those in terms of being able to write down these words. Right. When Nancy was reading through all of that, that's how I looked at it in terms of how we are communicating. We are communicating with the administration, we are conducting business here, and we are communicating with the community because we are talking in terms of communication. But then overarching all of this is always having that lens that you talked about is students' educational welfare. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah I have no problem pirating that first one. That's, <laughs> pirating? I like that word. Well, Arr. 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 <laughs> so, you've written down a couple things that we have added, people have added that they'd like to see included. Are there things that people would like to see excluded from what we already have to look at the document? Things that... I had one more included. Um, Oh, yeah, please. Um, before we exclude, just when we are making decisions about a topic, to it's sort of an obvious thing, but to 
consider all stakeholders related to that topic because sometimes we you know think only about the students and not about the staff or sometimes we think and we, we are sort of a bridge right. and right. I just like that reminder that if, if something is coming up we think about um, just all stakeholders. Well, and I think that will be relevant in a number of different things, that almost everything we do, that there are different groups that need to be considered differently yeah. and included. And that we keep each other honest to make sure that the, the groups, all stakeholders are represented in our decision making. That's, That's a fantastic a point. statement. Yeah, I also think if we can think about proactively reaching out to them too, right, if we want any kind of input or feedback, that may be another thing to consider. Mm -hmm. Can I also just say, I don't think number two is necessary. We set the example for promoting a positive collegial image for our school system and community. I'm not even quite sure why that's there. Uh, I kind of think that's a given in some ways. So. There are some that I think we all hope are givens. Yeah, right? they're right. all givens. But they're all then yes, they but I, I, at some point weren't, so that's why they're right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think that is probably that their is an unfortunate truth, probably. So. Uh, hopefully, many iterations ago, there must have been some kind of an issue that sparked that. I just worry about this positive word, you know, does that mean forced cheerfulness about what's going on? Everything's great, we have a great school, nobody complain. You're gonna That's get, what you're get your pay cut if you're not smiling. Yeah, so I, I just think it's a bit much. I, don't. I, I also think, um, you know, in terms of, again last year we talked about this, the number, number five is more the philosophy. Right, to channel all requests for information through the superintendent, right? But I feel like seven that talks to copy the superintendent, it's a bit too much. I disagree. It, it, it actually, <laughs> that actually comes up, came up from an issue that I personally created. Um, well done. So I can speak to that. <laughs> um, it, it, it was, it, I was communicating with somebody on a project that we were, I was working on, and it was not an intentional oversight, but it was something that the superintendent, it would have been nice for her to have known that I was having a conversation, like just, just to be aware of the general discussion. I think and it's very important. And my first meeting, MASS told me that that was mandatory. <laughs> I mean, it, it, is that just, right? Well, well, I don't mean mandatory in the sense of legally, but it's one of the things that they suggest, to me, right, to suggest to me not to live without it. So my, here's where I'm coming at it from. I do think that we absolutely must keep the superintendent informed of any business that we are doing with anybody on her team, right? Not just the administrative team. This only says administrative team, right? It doesn't talk to the entire staff. Yes, but NASS suggested that we add language around that I as well. I think it should be <laughs> everyone in yeah. terms of making sure you're in the loop of everything, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the philosophy. That's the thing that we want to do. And the email communication is but one of the things, right? I may be having a sidebar conversation with a teacher. How are you supposed to know that? How does that get covered? So I think in terms of philosophy, we need to talk about that, that we should not throw you off and not, you know, not include you in these conversations and that we absolutely must keep you in the loop and not have these conversations separately. And the email communication is simply a part of it. That's how I look at it. Yeah. So it's a great, I, I agree with, I agree with entirely. And it, it also covers the fact that it's not just me that makes mistakes here. No, no, I don't think you are. Um, in the interest of time, if it's okay, I'd like to push the, these suggestions forward for the next month and we'll work it and people, if you have additional things, can send them directly to Carol and we can come back and take a stab at actually changing the document and hopefully be ready to vote, but we shouldn't vote on it next month if we're not ready to. Is it, is it possible that uh, it's put on Google Share Drive and someone actually takes the lead on? So we can't because that would violate open meeting law. No, I, I guess to start off, right? Someone has to take this on, no? We can we have to take that in the meeting. We can't. It, it, it can go through her. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to take that on? I will. Yeah. Okay. okay. But, but sh she can't share back to no, say, of you not. know, Nina and Nick said not. this. No, or, I, you know. I understand that. Absolutely. Okay, so that's, I think that was a really fruitful discussion. So thank you, I look forward to um, next month. And with that, um, we are ready to move on to uh, the fall, uh, new business, the fall production advisor, which you see, Mr. Paul. Does it make sense oh, to come here? It does, yeah. come, come right up. Oh, right. Good morning.
morning. Good morning. Saying good evening. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of nice. Um, so, uh, as you may know, um, this past school year, uh, Ms. Helene Gifford resigned. She was our drama teacher for uh, 12 years. And so we appointed a long-term sub for the remainder of the school year. And uh, in going through stipends uh, and preparing stipends for this year, what we uncovered is that we actually did not have a stipend for a fall production um, uh, advisor. So every year we do a fall production and we do a spring production. The fall is our play, the um, spring is the musical. And um, so Miss Gifford all these years has been doing it uh, without uh, being compensated as part of a stipend. And so that brings me here. The high school has um, uh, a fall production stipend and that's what the stipend is, uh, step, you know, essentially uh, comes from in terms of the number of dollars. So I'm requesting uh, the, a stipend to officially be appointed to uh, Miss Allison Porter, who is the uh, drama teacher uh, for the fall production. Sounds good to me. Any questions, discussions? Okay. In that case, um, absent any discussion, I would seek a motion to approve this change stipend. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. Move to approve the stipend position for the fall production advisor for the 2018-19 school year for the Hopkinton Middle School. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Yes. yes. Any opposed? And motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. And then uh, next up, we have you again for the writing club advisory. Um, so we have, I'm particularly proud of uh, the number of clubs and activities that uh, are available to our students. Um, and so last year, uh, Ms. Mary Vera started a writing club for students that proved to be successful. She produced a, a nice um, book and binder that she distributed to all the kids who contributed poems and uh, short pieces uh, to that. So it proved to be successful. So uh, I would like to, and she would like to continue with the club next year, and therefore I'm requesting uh, a stipend uh, for, to be officially appointed to that position for writing club. Our computer programming club is not running next year. We had um, some st a student who was kind of led the charge, and one of the ways that we operate with clubs is we have teachers say, I want to run this club, and we have students who say, I'd like this club. And so that was one of those clubs that a student brought to our attention. Um, he's now at the high school, and uh, we've seen dwindling interest in the computer programming club. Um, and so uh, that is a stipend that is available, so I'm hoping to um, move the monies from uh, computer programming to writing. And one, you go ahead. And, um, one question I have on the computer programming club. Is there something else around um, you know, computers that you have besides a computer programming club? And with kids coming into the new grade, which will happen only in September, you may hear perhaps someone will step up. How would you handle that then? Um, so we may. Um, well, I guess uh, the first question, um, I mean, there is not, that, that is our only computer program. That was only our, op our only opportunity for computer programming. So students will uh, get some experience in working in some code, but in terms of a full-fledged computer programming, that was our only spot to do that in the school. Um, if we have, and we inevitably every year, and that's one of our pitches that we make to the grade six students, we say if there's something on this long list that you are interested in and don't see here, for instance, we had Slime Club that was introduced to us last year. Um, I didn't realize Slime was as popular as it is, but uh, it is a big big thing right now, or at least it was. And so, um, so typically what we say is the first year, if we have a teacher or an advisor that is willing to take it on, uh, that first year is essentially runs for free to make sure that it, it's a viable thing, that we have enough kids signing up for it. And then in the second year, and that's what happened with the writing club, and then in the second year, then we seek uh, a stipend for for that position. Yeah, I guess in my mind, it's great to start a new club, yeah. but I don't want us to feel that it's, in, you know, we have to take from one to yeah. support another. I hope that, you know, kids feel that they can um, avail of the computer programming club too. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and that's something that we'll talk about uh, with the kids too, and, and okay. uh, when we kind of promote the different things that are available to them. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I love the writing club. Uh, guess, could you just explain how it works? Like, how do students submit? Do they actually write together, or do they submit work? I'm just curious how it works. Yeah, so it's individual pieces. So they they will look to like a typical uh, meeting might be the kids will come in and they'll talk about some of the things that are going on in their classes, and Mrs. Vera will uh, present a piece, whether it be a poem from obviously from an established author. Uh, or you know a, a short literary piece, and then the students uh, have an opportunity to try and like emulate that 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 style, 
Um, but they also have opportunities to do some free writing on their own based on some of the things that they're experiencing individually or uh, in their classroom. Is there output, the booklet, is it available? Is it electronic or paper? Uh, well, so this first year was just distributed just to the kids in the class, so it wasn't, um, it wasn't distributed to the public. Um, we do have, which is a totally different thing, but we do have a literary, um, a newspaper club that just started this year as well. Um, but that, and that is something that is distributed, uh, that we uh, put in the, in the lobby to the middle school. And, but it's not electronic, it's all, right. they, they, they really want it to be wow. on paper. Yeah. <laughs> so. Cool. That's great. Anything else? Discussion? Yeah. Questions? That's great. In that case, I will uh, seek a motion to approve the change stipend position for writing club advisor for the 2018-19 school year for the Hopkinton Middle School. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, unanimous and so carries. <coughs> Congratulations on your new uh, writing club advisory. Thank uh, you. The next thing on our agenda is the uh, Hopkinton Middle School New York City trip. So this past June, uh, we uh, went to New York City for our second consecutive year. It was, uh, by all accounts, a really successful trip. Students and parents um, talked very favorably about it. The chaperones felt like it was a really successful trip. The weather was outstanding and we're hoping to um, replicate that once again next year. So June 5th through the 7th, we're seeking our final uh, approval uh, from you for to attend uh, New York City. Um, the cost it is um, between $750 to $770, depending on the number of students. Um, and um, right now, in terms of enrollment, our, our actual um, enrollment is 295. We're projected to go up to 299. So um, uh, if we have anywhere from 280 students or above attend and sign up for the trip, the cost will be $749. Um, if it's 260 or below, it's $769. How many students in the grade are not, like what percentage of the grade is currently enrolled? Uh, so they haven't signed up for the trip yet. Oh, so the 295 was? Uh, that's the no total number of kids in the class. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, so, uh, for instance, Amanda, last year we had 17 students that did not attend the New York City trip. And two, I think 286 was last year's eighth grade. Okay. Is, is there a financial aid? There is, yes. So actually, I mean, so there were several students uh, through a variety of means. I mean, um, we... Um, our goal, and I, we've been successful with this, is never let a student um, not attend because of financial assistance. So uh, our, that's what our student activities fee is for. Jump Street, the company we've worked with, um, has, off, has offered us a scholarship each year as well. That class has really grown. Uh, it, yeah, back when they were in like first and second grade, it was significantly smaller. Really? I, yeah. I did not realize they were that close to 300. Yeah. Other questions? Can I ask about the Broadway play? <laughs> Just, what was the reasoning behind choosing a Broadway play rather than a, another type of theatrical production? Um, I guess um, I think that when we um, originally talked about moving from Washington, D.C. to New York City, we, we thought that um, an experience on Broadway would be um, one of those kind of key pieces of New York City that uh, again the, kid, the kids take drama in the middle school and so it was an opportunity to kind of see um, one of the highlights of New York City. But I, but I don't know that we went much further than that. I would be interested in... I'm just curious if, if you link it to something on the curriculum yeah. or some drama performance, a musical that you do here. I see, yes, yeah. Yeah, we've got to see Wicked the past two years. We're, we're the, the schedule comes out in September. Um, and so two years ago, uh, we uh, were fortunate enough to have Gregory McGuire, the author of Wicked, uh, come and speak to students. So that was an exciting connection that we were able to make between uh, having Gregory McGuire speak to our students and, and seeing Wicked. OK. Um. If there are no more questions or comments, I would seek a motion to approve uh, the Hopkinton Middle School overnight grade 8 field trip for June 5th through 7th, 2019 to New York City. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And I am also a yes, so it carries 5-0. Uh, and 
Uh, that brings us to yet again, Mr. Kelly, you were really in the hot seat <laughs> yeah, today. Uh, there today, the transfer of a 0.4 FTE position. Thank you. I think I'm going to start doing all of our business in the summer. Can we do my budget presentation? <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, last year in looking at projections um, and going through the budget process, it appeared as though we were, would need an additional 0.4 language position. Um, so in, um, I think in May, we posted for a 0.4 Spanish teacher. Um, and unfortunately, um, we have not received, uh, we've received very few applicants, first of all, and the applicants that we've received uh, are either not certified or uh, we do not feel would be uh, appropriate um, uh, for this teaching position. So we started kind of coming up with plan B and plan C. Um, and, um, and one of those things that we looked at um, was Let's take a look at the numbers. So we recently ran uh, the numbers within Power School and ultimately looked at Spanish classes. And we actually had more kids take fr French uh, than we anticipated. Uh, and French class sizes were reasonable. And then we started looking at Spanish class sizes and ultimately determined that we actually can go without this 0.4 FTE in Spanish and still have class sizes that are 22 and 23, which is completely reasonable. Um, prior to that, they were in the, in the teens, um, which um, is, is not necessary. Um, so in looking at this and trying to come up with a solution, um, one of the things, another topic of conversation that Dr. Zaleski and I and the guidance counselors have had over the years has been uh, students with some social emotional behavioral issues over the course of time and how we work with those students. And so we started talking last year, in fact, uh, last summer, um, about um, how we can better address these students' needs. And so we began talking with the counselors and looking at caseloads and looking at students, and in some cases, um, uh, students with some of these behavioral, social, emotional needs uh, were either, had either gone to alternative educational settings or were placed in intensive special education um, and, and, or were placed in our START program, none of which are the ideal setting for these students uh, that we're sending in those places or the students that are in those um, settings. Um, so um, this past year we talked a lot about trying to get this program up and running and kind of build its foundation. Um, and when this point four, when I looked at this point four, I said maybe this is the opportunity to not just talk about this class in theory and kind of begin piloting but to actually put it in place. So we have a teacher on staff uh, who has extensive experience working in a behavioral program, working with uh, restorative practices in a previous district. Uh, it is an, uh, an area of interest of hers. Um, and so she's been doing some summer curriculum work with our school adjustment counselor and with our school psychologist, as well as with Dr. Zaleski. And so um, what kind of combining these two things, the, 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 no, the lack of need for a Spanish teacher as well as um, this program that we were trying to get up off the ground, I, I thought it would be an opportunity um, to really get it up and running and take that point four and direct it to that teacher's current role, which is a special education teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, her, her caseload is increasing, and so as I was looking at her caseload, I'm seeing that she's going to be less and less available to these students with social, emotional, uh, and behavioral needs. Um, so what I'm proposing and requesting is to shift that point four Spanish FTE over to special education so that this teacher, so that the point four person could take over this teacher's caseload, the majority of this teacher's caseload, freeing the teacher um, to work in this program, the social emotional program called Empower. So, um, let's look at the questions. Yes. Is it time for questions? I think so, yes. Okay. Yeah. So the point for that you talk about, um, again, you know, back to the previous comment that I was making, do we really need to take it away from one to put it into the other? If there is a need, there is a need, right? And is there any other way that it could be met? And I'm also wondering, you know, I know Dr. Kavner talked about the tech program, but that's more a training program, correct? Um, yeah, and I think that the, the tech program has more to do with school safety rather than meeting the behavioral needs of on a day-to-day -day basis. I do you see. know what I mean? I, I, I do, but at the same time it had that safety, not in terms of physical safety necessarily, but around arising from social emotional concerns. Is that, is that right? 
It does, to a degree, the tech program that you and I have talked about, Karen. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I'm bringing that into context is that we this is a big focus, mm -hmm. right, the social-emotional learning. And I do think that having a balanced human being is so much more important than, you know, the achievements that we have, you know, which we were all talking about in the context of educational welfare. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how is it that we are strengthening our core academic work to bring those to ensure that some of those needs are met right through the curriculum and where is how, where's that lens how is that happening so some information on that if that can be shared perhaps a future agenda item because i feel like if we are doing you know okay we have a social emotional need we have these cases etc but where are they rising from right why is it happening can we uh, how are we addressing the root cause of it, if you will? Um, that's something I'm interested in hearing. So I think, uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, I mean, so one of the things that we're doing next year is, um, and, and I agree with you, um, you know, what I, can, I think what I hear you saying is, so we've got these kids who have the, who kind of have these more intensive needs, to, so much so that we're having them go to this teacher who specializes in this stuff. But, what are we doing to prevent them from to getting to that level? Absolutely. So one of the things in grade six that we're starting next year, uh, based on that, is a guidance seminar. So um, that that's something that we added this uh, that we're adding into next year. To, to so our guidance counselors traditionally have operated on the model where they would go into classrooms on occasion, but kind of do a, a one-time presentation to students or a two-time presentation to students. And that's where they would kind of make their pitch about the guidance services, and then they would say, we're in the guidance office if you need our help. Um, so we're trying to shift that um, and have them actually teach a guidance seminar to grade six students, whereas it's more of, instead of just saying, we're here if you need help, uh, they're actually building, they've built their curriculum and they're delivering it in grade six. And so it's only at grade six, and we're, we're trying to figure out how, how we can continue that service so it's not just, I mean, it's better than the one-shot deal that they had in the past, but um, it's still just, you know, 25 lessons over the course of a child's uh, career at the middle school. But that's kind of, you know, we look at that as kind of that tier one um, services that all students get. And then this is, you know, more of that um, students need some, some additional support. Uh, so they're getting it in that way. Um, the other thing I wanted to, and, and again, maybe I'm, uh, I don't need to answer this, but in terms of the tech program, the tech program tends to um, operate on a uh, students are largely in the tech classroom and then they're integrated in, in some of the classrooms, whereas this program would be mainly about kids are still in, um, for the most part, in their regularly scheduled classes, but when they have an episode or when they have a situation, then they would go to this classroom. They would also have time scheduled into their day, uh, potentially being pulled from a related arts class or some other class where they would be meeting with the teacher to work on some of those underdeveloped skills. Yeah, I think what we're talking about here are kids who are lacking in skills or who do have great difficulty self-regulating. So I think the appropriate word that you've used is episode. So, I mean, lots of our kids are kids who will get a little antsy in class because, you know, this just isn't engaging, but this is a kid who just can't seem to self-regulate and has to sometimes come out of the classroom so that they can access the learning in another setting or and to enable, you know, the other kids in that classroom to be able to access the learning without the disruption. Is this yeah. targeting eighth graders only? No, sixth to eight. I, okay. Yeah, so I mean, so this, so, and something that might have been some confusion in the memo. So, um, and I apologize for that. So, um, the, the teacher um, that I think is ideal for this, is, her name is Samantha Harris. So, she is currently scheduled to be an eighth grade um, learning specialist and working with students in special education in grade eight. Okay, so, her um, so, the, so if approved, then the point four um, special education position would be in grade eight. But this would be for all students, this the Empower program. Can, can I ask a few questions? Um, I love the idea of this program. I think it's high time for it because it would be really lovely if we could keep more students in district mm -hmm. and sending them out. But I'm curious how a point four position can handle all of these moments of anxiety throughout the course of a day. And is it sufficient? Don't you need more? I mean, to get a really good program like this going, mm -hmm. shouldn't we give it more support? Well, so um, so that's so the point four person. So with with um, you know essentially with reduced uh, our current grade seven is smaller than it's been a long time. So they're at two hundred and I think twenty eight students right now, whereas typically it's two eighty two ninety. 
Um, so we were able to shift our special education caseloads um, such that uh, we have three special educators in grade eight, and then we have two special educators, sorry, three special educators in grade, uh, sorry, let me try that again, two special educators in grade seven, and then we had um, two special educators full-time in grade eight and uh, a part-time, so we had Samantha Harris, the person that I mentioned, uh, but she had a smaller caseload than her counterparts, and so the thinking originally was that she was going to be working with these students that are in special education, but then also when her schedule allowed that she would be part of this Empower program where we were kind of piloting and getting it off the ground. Um, so if this point four is approved to take her special education caseload, um, that point four would be just working in special education. Samantha could largely, I would say, I'm, I can say right now, I think, you know, 90 to 100% of her time could be dedicated to the Empower program. Okay. Yeah. Because it seems so important to me that we have such exorbitant costs sending students out of district. Mm -hmm. That what can we do to help build up the foundation within the school so these kids aren't flown to distant lands and their families discombobulated by that process. So I know this is a, a larger issue, but I think it'd be lovely if we could work with Dr. Zaleski and, and you to think about ways to enlarge or enhance the special ed program so we don't have to dislocate these kids from their communities. And some of the kids going to the Empower program may not be students on IEPs as well. Right. Yes. So some of our other kids could be general education students. And I think when we think about kids who have had outplacements, we have also lost some of our kids to homeschooling. Sure. When they've had, had these sorts of issues, parents sure. will just say, well, then I'm just going to take care of business at home. Yeah. You know, Which and is I, a huge financial burden for those parents. It is, and I think it's also, I mean, I like to think that in the Hopkinton Public Schools, these kids could be getting really a top-rate education, right? I'm not suggesting that parents aren't doing that, but it would really be nice to have these kids be part of our community and part of the learning. Yeah, it goes back to what we were talking, and I thought all students should be in public schools, which is something I would like to see happen. One of the things I liked, if I read it correctly, and maybe I didn't, is that it seemed like there was going to be a, a training element with both parents and teachers, so yes. that the interventions mm -hmm. that are taught, the self-regulation that's taught to the students can be um, can be reinforced at home. Is it, is that, did I get that right? Because I yeah. really like the idea of having that consistent language and approach. And then if there's a, a general ed student or another student exhibiting an episode that has ever, you know, that's unprecedented, there are techniques that staff is aware of that they've learned from this other student that they can then apply. I mean, that was kind of my understanding. There's sort of a train the trainer to some degree. Yeah, and so, I mean, a lot of uh, what we've done in terms of program development is based on our START program, and our START program is for you know, students transitioning back from hospitalization or uh, who've had a concussion or some school anxiety. And so a big part of the START um, piece is uh, you know, working with parents and making sure we're doing that full wraparound, uh, working with parents, working with all the teachers that that student sees throughout the course of the day. So that's absolutely a, a, an essential component of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and do we have to move, shift it from the Spanish program in order to fulfill so. this? Um, well, I mean, that's where, the, that's where the FTEs are right now, and, and honestly, as, as much as I don't want to say uh, I don't need a teacher, um, like, it's, you know, the class sizes would range from 13 to 18 if we kept the point four Spanish position, and uh, as somebody who's looking at all the numbers and seeing, you know, numbers between 22 and 24, you know, uh, 24, that seems very small, and so I, I, I think it's available to us, I guess, is... What I'm saying. I mean, so, so you're saying that the Spanish program would be manageable definitely, with yes. what you have. It would be. I had asked too about projections. It seemed like looking forward, like the next few years. Yeah. I mean, we've got this now. We give it up, and we've got to come forward again and ask for it. So, next year you're confident that your foreign language can be met, as far as you know. Yes, I am. Unless, unless there is a substantial increase in enrollment, but you know, so next year is, as I mentioned earlier, the current seventh grade. Um, they're they're small. They're two twenty. So I, I certainly think that we can manage this, uh, and certainly through next year. Uh, I don't think unless there's a population explosion in, in grade seven. Should knock on wood right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Others. Senator Harris. Um, yeah. Ready to move for a, a motion on this? In that case, I would uh, seek a motion to approve the previously budgeted 0.4 FTE Spanish teacher position to a 0.4 FTE grade eight special educator position. 
So moved. Second. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Um, uh, yes, so that uh, carries by nothing. And thank you very much for sharing so much of your morning with us. <laughs> of course, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings us along very nicely to the um, Hopkinton Public Schools website refresh with Mr. Ghosh. Um, while we're shifting into that, if somebody could pass in a coffee, I would greatly <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We took a brief break while we shifted gears to bring Mr. Goshen to talk about our website refresh. So with that, thank you uh, for coming in. Thank you for having me. So it's me just kind of giving an overview of what the expectation and what the, the goal and direction is. Is that a good start? That would be great. Um, so you just starting this past spring, you know, uh, and even sooner, uh, you know, we've had talks internally as a technology department about, you know, looking at the road ahead in terms of upgrading and updating our, our district website and all of the school websites. Uh, once we've had those conversations, we've had some initial conversation with some school committee members to talk about some possible things that uh, the school committee also would maybe like enhance or update it um, within uh, our current site. Uh, so. Once we had those discussions, um, I reached out to our current vendor, which is Blackboard, uh, and I also reached out to Final Sight and have had several meetings with both those companies to try to see what would be the best process to try to move forward with a new design while maintaining our current site, which isn't always an easy process. Um, so at this point, you know, I'm trying to recommend to the committee that we consider a new custom design website uh, through Blackboard, um, which is at the moment estimated to be around $17,000, which completely covers the redesign of the district homepage, the five uh, building homepages, and the supporting pages as well. Um, they would take us through a complete redesign process. Their design website designers would meet with us, would go through a complete design process where we would you know suggest to them all the design elements and components that we want all the goals that we have for uh, the new site and then they would make some initial designs for us to vet and approve um, and then we would try to work to publish those pieces uh, when we're ready and so we're looking at an estimated four to six month time frame uh, to do that so our hope would be before winter break of launching the new site um, some of the reasons for sticking with the company um, is there's several. I mean, the one being all of our data is there currently. Uh, so Blackboard um, a few years ago bought School Wires. School Wires was our original website company that actually designed our original website. So that was designed about eight years ago. That was also a custom design. So Blackboard acquired them just about two years ago. So Blackboard is a large company, obviously, that has lots of different products. So one of them is a web community builder, which is what this product would be. Um, so separate from a learning management system, it's just completely a web uh, community manager. And so the reason for sticking with them, one is all of our data is there. All of our staff are currently already trained on the site. So there would be a little bit of training on some of the new features and functionalities, but it wouldn't be a whole new company with a whole new process where we have to spend hours retraining all of our staff to use it. So that's a big plus since we're really limited on professional development time uh, and teacher time. So we considered that. Uh, in addition, when we looked at the other uh, companies uh, that had templates that we could possibly apply and move our data to, not only would we have to pay for a new design for those companies, we'd have to still continue to pay our renewal and subscription for our current company. So we'd have to pay for our current company, we'd have to pay for the design in a new company, plus the renewal in a new company. So when you look at the, the move, plus all the complications of the moves, uh, it was making more sense to stay with our current company. Um, not cons and also looking at teacher websites. So teachers have a number of websites that are pre-populated being summer and in the fall, that's not a good time to just automatically take those teacher websites down um, as we would move to a different company. So looking at all those factors, it was starting to make sense to try to stick with the current company, and that company was well vetted you know, years ago when they first did the look, uh, when we first did our original design. So we're pretty confident and happy with that company. Uh, so I guess I'm here to kind of get your feedback on what you feel um, are the next steps to kind of uh, move forward and just to kind of get your um, 
level of comfort with spending that money uh, on the new design. So I had a couple of questions I did okay. actually ask in advance about about this and okay. just wanted to highlight the one about the for everyone to hear the the seventeen thousand dollars is money that we're, you are not asking for in addition to your budget, correct? But it's money that has come back for technology through an, the other hole. I don't want to explain it wrong, but yeah, the E-rate program. The e so program. yeah, so part of the part of uh, E-rate um, every year, depending on the services we're looking for, um, we get a, we get a discount based on what we're buying, and there's two different categories of E-rate. But uh, this year we're doing some wiring upgrades and some core switch upgrades, and and. Buying that equipment will give us a 40% a discount on that equipment when that discount is intended for schools to reinvest in their technology infrastructure. So we could use uh, some of that money to uh, spend on this website redesign. And so it wouldn't be an additional ask. So I do have a few questions. Sure. Uh, so obviously anything to do, you know, we've all talked about that this website absolutely needs a refresh. There's no doubt about it. And I think when we sat down, we looked at some of the challenges that are out there. Um, so I'll, I'll come to some of those challenges in a minute, but in terms of the provider that you're talking about, um, I saw the HPS digital site mm -hmm. that you had shared with us. Mm -hmm. That was fantastic. And I'm just wondering, um, what does that cost to have? Mm -hmm. Who's the provider there? Um, have we considered, have you had a chance to look at a few other providers? I completely understand the challenges that you talked about that, you know, we'll have to continue to pay, etc. Uh, and also in terms of trending. So I'm just wondering, talk a little, if you could share a little bit about the HPS Digital. Sure. And, uh, you know, that look and feel seems fantastic. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we started that website probably just about four years ago, maybe five years ago. And ideally, it was uh, developed more as a, a blogging site originally, you know, to kind of share posts from all the tech integration teachers about um, what kind of tech integration was going on in the district. And so they, when they would collaborate with a teacher on a given lesson, uh, they would try to kind of write that up to kind of showcase what was happening in the district. Um, and so we thought that uh, WordPress was originally designed to kind of to, as a blogging website company. So uh, we kind of uh, set up that site. It's a it's a self-hosted site, so we pay for the domain name, which is like ten bucks a year, eighteen bucks a year, um, and we we paid for an initial template, which was you know maybe a hundred dollars to kind of set that up. So annually we're paying like eighteen dollars a year to kind of maintain that site. So. There's not, a, there's not a huge cost uh, involved in that. Um, so, you know, I guess the difference, you know, in looking at that type of site versus, you know, what we currently have for our district site uh, is that our district site is, is more designed for multiple users on the back end to be engaged in writing content to the website in kind of a controlled way. Or in Word, WordPress, you can, at certain levels, have an administrator level, and you can have certain levels, but it doesn't have... I guess the the detail that you would need on the back end to manage a large group of people working on it simultaneously, if you will, okay. uh, and it's more focused on you know um, blogging and some other things. And so it, it could work, but I think when you're looking at a large scale district size website, it's not necessarily the best platform on the back end okay. uh, to do that kind of work. Um, if we had a different setup and, and, or if you decide that we maybe were going in a direction where we had a webmaster in-house that was primarily the main person in charge of our website, that could be a type of service or company we could use that was doing that. But because that's not the current way we have the district set up, I don't think it's the best way uh, to, to go or the best approach to use as a, as a district hosting company, if you will. Um, a few other questions. Sure. So at some point, you know, or with this new uh, provider that you're looking at, would there be some form of integration of, you know, the digital or any other sites which might be out there, which are related to the district uh, integrating that? Yeah, and I think the idea would be, at least in terms of HPS Digital, which is the, the, the technology website, would be to, to bring that in-house back into the school's um, website. Uh, because there's a lot of information, for example, on that site about the one-to-one -one programs and about policies and about how-to. There's a lot of how-to guides. So we would probably just 
uh, reabsorb that into the into the district site once it was once it was redone. You know, there's a couple other you know um, school based sites you know like that. Like for example, H H Press is another. It's a high school based site that the newspaper uses. That's an external site, but that's probably wouldn't be brought in house just because it's it's teaching them how to manage and, and um, host their own website and to post to it and the responsibilities that go with it. So that would probably stay intact uh, as its own independent site, and we would just probably link to it within our, our district site. I see. Um, and I'm also wondering that uh, in terms of some of the challenges that we talked about with mm -hmm. even the current school management, uh, the mm -hmm. management of that website, um, you know, whether it be different users, some of the old content that's out there, how will that, uh, you know, how, what's the plan around that? And how will sure. this help? Yeah, so I think in general, the, the design change isn't going to necessarily help how it's managed on the back end, right? So the management on the back end is going to have to do with like procedures and policies that we kind of establish and training and routines that we have established with teachers, right? So I think one of the issues that we face and, cha you know, the challenges as you speak is just primarily making sure teachers are updating the teacher websites um, on the district pages. And so the challenge we have with that is that some teachers are using Blackboard, if you will, for their main teacher web pages, and other teachers are not. And so some of those teachers uh, are using them daily and they're updating those websites, and others have just used it as a launch pad, if you will, to all of their other resources that they're using. And so that is a decision I think we have to make as a district. Are we going to say, you know, you're using it and you're updating it, and if you're not, you're just linking to the resources that you're using, and that, that's fine. So I think we've started to have that conversation, Dr. Kavanaugh. Now I've already had initial conversations with principals to say this is kind of our expectation. We've had initial communication go out with teachers to give them some time to start to update those pages. And if they weren't being updated, we were going to move to take those pages down um, later this summer. So the goal is you update them or we're, we're removing them um, so that it looks fresh and, and the parents have the information that they need. So that is, that is one of the challenge. That's going to be a combination of management on our part and some, some procedural changes. Um, the other challenge I think we've had with our current website is the calendar, right? So the calendar um, typically is um, populated via Google calendars. Um, those Google calendars are shared with the HPTA. So they're, we're actually publishing our calendar of events on HPTA calendars. And those are not official school calendars, which is an issue which we've worked on which I have some yeah. personal issues with, or professional issues with. It was the one way we could get it all to work, sure. but I think we need to revisit that. I don't think the HPTA should mm -hmm. be the primary owner of our official school calendars. Okay. So that okay. being said, no offense against the HPTA, <laughs> no Facebook will be going crazy. They've, that was the only way we could get it to work in our current setup, yeah. so that events were shareable to the community and they were helping us share those with parents as well. So it was a, a mutual relationship that was working. But I think when we, we go forward, the new site will have a two-way sync. So if we post something on our website, that event will be automatically syncing with a Google Calendar. If a principal or secretary of building adds an event to the Google Calendar, that will sync back to the website calendar. And that was a huge factor in this decision as well. Final Slate, these other companies we're working at didn't have that two-way sync. So this is a new API that only Blackboard seemed to have, and that was another deciding factor because that was a big challenge that we currently face with our current website. So this redesign will address that issue, uh, and then we'll need to have some further dialogues with the HPTA about how to share out to their calendars. Uh, but that will give us uh, a better look and feel of our web calendar. It will kind of match the theme that we go with, and it won't be kind of an embedded iframe, and it won't really, that doesn't really match. But then it will also be able to feed the events and the regular uh, Google calendars that teachers and people use on a regular basis will have access to. So that challenge, that challenge will be corrected. Right, and, and I guess, um, Ashok, when, when I looked at this item, the, f the thought that came to my mind is absolutely in favor of wanting that refresh from mm -hmm. my perspective. And knowing all the challenges that we have and knowing that all the things that you do, 
and also taking pictures of school committee members mm -hmm. and so many other things. Is there, are there other needs? I would like to see a more comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. You know, how long is this going to be? Do you need this 17,000 just one time? Is it going to be yearly? Um, you know, do we need any additional, I don't know, point for resource or more resources that helps manage? How are we going to manage some of the issues that we have related to content and updation of all of that? What does the look and feel going to look like? Kind of getting a preview of that. Perhaps taking some of the comments from the um, community that we have received mm -hmm. around um, engagement with the website, etc. I think a broader plan, if you, and I know mm -hmm. you're fantastic at presentations. If that could be shared in that context, it would help me personally a lot with, uh, you know, placing where the 17,000 uh, sure. falls in the big scheme of things. And some, some timelines, broad timelines, I know you've talked about the four to six months, but are there some mid-level goals? And when it comes to the calendar, I know we spend a lot of time talking about the calendar at some point and perhaps syncing it, n not perhaps, but the need to sync it with the community calendar that we created, which is now on the HCAM side, how do we make sure that things appear there. So I think there are a lot of touch points and a lot of sure. things that we've talked about. If we can present that holistically, it could help a lot that there is this plan overall, and this is this first step we absolutely need in order to ac accommodate all of this. That would help me. Sure, I'd be happy to put together the plan. And I think the one reason I was holding off was I wasn't sure if, if this is something the school committee was going to want to move forward with. So because we do have a lot of different projects, I wasn't going to invest a lot of time in, in, in putting together a plan for this if it wasn't going to happen this year. Sure. So um, if it's made and we decide to move forward with this because this is something all we, we agree on that's important to do, then I will move forward <coughs> and, and put together that small subgroup that we talked about and start to put together the plan once we've had uh, some meetings with um, you know Blackboard to talk about what their goals are. We'll talk and decide what our goals are. And we can kind of put that out in a project plan and then I'm happy to communicate that to, to all of you and to the public. Um, and so I'm, I'm good with that. Um, but in terms of the cost, you had to ask a question about the cost. Uh, the 17000 is a one-time cost that um, basically pays for specifically the design and the implementation of the design. It does not include the renewal cost. So we typically have a roughly $8,000 annual renewal fee that pays for the content management system itself, and we've been paying that uh, over the last several years. So that will be maintained. Um, and what that cost covers is obviously the upgrade to the back end, uh, updates to any of our templates. As they update their back end, sometimes the template has to be updated, so that renewal pays for that and all the support that goes with it. So that's a separate $8,000 payment that we typically budget for and pay, and that will continue. Um, beyond as we move forward with this design or not. Even if we don't move forward with this design, we'll still be paying our annual $8,000 to maintain our current website. And I, I just want to make sure, I know I've asked a lot of questions asking for all of this information. Mm -hmm. Your enthusiasm and, you know, the work around it, it's very much appreciated, it's much needed. And the fact that you looked at other ways to finding that money and not asking for anything additional, that's also very much appreciated. Thank you. I have one question, sure. um, and, and you mentioned it earlier. Do you think there's a need for us to consider in the future of having a webmaster, someone whose responsibility, because I don't think it really is, even though your director of technology doesn't know your job to keep the website updated, that's just a small piece of such a huge amount of responsibility yeah. that you have. But I think even things as simple as when we update a policy, making sure that the updated policy and the update date is accurate, and when we post minutes that they're up there in a timely manner, and when we, any of the things that the, that the, the schools do right. that need to be updated in a timely manner, I think, um, is that part of the 8,000 that we pay in order to have that company do that, or no, is that we, something we need a webmaster we do in order that. to? So it is, it is yeah. me or, or Linda, some of the busiest people in the district. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> sort of my Sorry, question. I'll speak for so, myself. Yeah, so do uh, we need to doing consider that? that? I mean, it, and it is, the, so, is, there, is there, you know, I mean, that's a cost too, but is would considering a webmaster versus considering this kind of update, would there be sort of balance some... I'm sure web right. master is more expensive than this. Right. But. So if we could, you're right. I, I think we're we're grappling with that now, mm -hmm. and we started to grapple with that this year as we started to have these conversations and to try to move forward. Maybe this fall, this budget season, we'll maybe have a more official presentation on what what we we think would work. But I, I think 
if you're looking at um, you know overall cost savings, like you know versus this this system versus a webmaster, we're going to end up paying more for a webmaster, sure. probably even if it's part time, right? Sure. So then the other thought is, well, you know how you know we want a, a website that's completely updated and um, accurate all the time, right. and and quickly as a change can can happen, we want that to happen, right? So to get to that level, that would be first driving the change. It would be. That would be my biggest concern first is making sure that, you know, as soon as a policy comes out, it's up. And we, we get there close, but some days it's good and we're there, and some days there's other things that are, are in queue that are more important and it doesn't happen as quickly. So if you just look at that scenario without considering cost, a webmaster or someone helping to manage that or someone that's at least designated primarily as their job or part-time job would be something to consider. Okay. Absolutely. It strikes me that maybe both are a necessary right. piece. That this refresh seems like it's very needed for I might, and I don't understand a lot about yeah. technology, so forgive my. Oh, it's funny. Like, but that there are some ADA compliance issues that could be brought up Correct. by somebody redesigning and things of that nature. Correct. Whereas then looking in the next budget cycle to perhaps bring somebody in to maintain all of these things and to be dedicated to that because I do recognize that both you and Linda are busy with far more within right. the technology realm that that might allow us as an entire district to keep this going. It yeah. just strikes me as a little... Yeah. You know, our director of technology right. is putting our policy updates well, on. Right. And not to belittle well, that rule, no, but I was throwing out boxes yesterday. I feel so like, you just, know, just, just you have, you have what an enormous amount of responsibility. Yeah. And so making sure that our policy updates are on there, it seems like it's such a small, yeah. important, and, but small piece for you. And your level of expertise is better used right. in other exactly. areas. We're not using probably. our resources appropriately. We, we, exactly. We have yeah. So I think it's either considering looking at another person or looking at internal staff to do it and seeing if we can train them specifically to target that because right now it is distributed you know leadership in a way as far as you know each bit individual building has some responsibility for it as do you know some of our, our staff you know some tech integration people are doing a lot with it as well and those numbers have come back you know so there's a reduction there so that is also a challenge you know moving forward so those people were doing a lot of the updates at the school levels and now those those positions are reduced to half so that concerns me as well. So looking forward, we're going to have to have some conversations about who is going to be responsible for it. Um, but, you know, in terms of the upgrade itself and the, and the process, regardless of the position, it still, I think, has to happen. Um, but in terms of maintenance, it, we need to have some discussions about. Separate issue. Sorry for bringing it up. No, it's an important <laughs> issue because you're right. You don't want to just spend all this time and all this money, have a beautiful website. And then after three months, you know, it's, it's not as, it's, as yeah. fresh. <laughs> so, which is just as important. I think it's what you're saying is, is critical. And I think that a webmaster or whomever, and actually the solution, while well, I'm 100% behind needing a new website, I think those are tools. Mm -hmm. Either mm -hmm. there's a human or a technology, those are tools. And it's never going to be any better than the process. And for me, like a lot of what the website, where my frustration emerges in using our current website, Maybe I don't like the look and feel, but that's not where the frustration comes from. It's from the content management procedures that fall down behind the scenes. And I think for me, investing in the tool, tempting as it is, I feel like it's, we're putting the cart before the horse because I think some real work needs to be done on defining procedures and processes with staff, with community, you know, the use of all those stakeholders because this is our, our face to the community. We talk about transparency and, and so forth. Everything breaks down if the procedures for maintaining it. I mean, it's not going to be good for more than a week. If so, I would love to. See, I mean, it's, it's very. It's hard to, to justify money on a process redesign because you don't get anything. You don't feel like you get anything tangible out of it. Mm -hmm. But I fear that if we design, um, pick design elements for the new tool in the absence of a process redesign, the new tool will reflect either our lack of process or our broken procedures. I just feel like I would love for us to invest in process right now. And, and, and you know, I just want to add, add to that is that some of the conversations that we have had in the fall and I think early spring 
were around the fact of even defining, you know, we had talked about the ADA compliance. So some of those issues exist. So perhaps you have thought of all of this, but to present that out would be fantastic uh, is where I was getting to. We had talked about exactly that, you know, content management is a huge issue. Who's the owner of that content? And we talked about some of the old, um, you know, links that are sitting out there, things that are not working. So a bunch of things that we have talked about if they can be listed out and we talked about I thought we had you know had a presentation around that we had internally reviewed at some point and talked about what that committee even looks like the subcommittee uh, about um, around you know who could be working on this right mm -hmm. what could be I think we had talked about a teacher in the high school who was a student and things like that so I'm just wondering um, you know in terms of next steps if you have thought through all of that that's fantastic if you could present that and show this as one of the steps and to Amanda's point about the processes sure. right how are you know how will they fit in with this new uh, redesign if you will and if you have thought about all that, that's fantastic. Uh, it would really help to see that. Yeah, no, I, I agree that the process, you know, design is, is, is important. I, I, I guess my thought would be, you know, having uh, that take place, you know, this mm -hmm. end of the summer and into the fall before the, you know, right. before the design was kind of done to, to clarify that, you know, to work with the group internally um, and then get feedback from parents and some administrators on that. I mean, the parents don't need to obviously understand our process. You know, as parents have a process as users. But, right. Right. There so, is a process. Yeah, that's important. When I need to find, you know, whatever. I've spent hours by trying to find out when early release time is for like right. whatever reason. It just doesn't show up in my brain. I don't connect with where it is. And, yeah. You know, the little things like there is a whole, there are. <clears throat> procedures that the user community, who are the parents, mm -hmm. use. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's important to consider, like, watch parents trying to find something. What, you know, just even focus groups to see currently what are the roadblocks that we're hitting. You know, it, and I think staff has, we can identify staff as owning content update, but staff has to then accept that job. Like somehow it has to be baked into the, the work day right. um, because it's a real thing. Like it's not enough, and it's very, very, very difficult to do process redesign on your own process. It's very helpful to have an outside look with people, you know, to pay. And you know, Amanda, I think uh, you know, Dr. Kevin, perhaps you were in that meeting too when when we met about the quick links, right? The quick links are so many at this point in time, and to understand from parents what is it that they quickly want on a day-to-day -day basis. Some parents might want to see lunch menu, right? So what are those things and defining all that? So again, um, some of these conversations have happened and I'm just wondering how can we broaden it and see it false context. And, and I know Ashok, you talked about it that you were looking to get a sense if we are all on board with this um, journey and you know wanting desire to spend um, on, on this particular initiative. I hope you're, perhaps we shift the motion to talk about um, an exploration almost of what this would what would it take to change and maintain the kind of first what is it that we are looking for right in terms of changes to the website second uh, what would it take to kind of create and change some of the processes and thirdly what would it take to maintain it going forward so if that exploration can happen and then that is presented what would you know the money the people so okay. would you prefer that we bring it back to you in August with more definition? That would be, I think so. Um, go ahead, Nancy. Would you I, I, think, I, I, don't, I don't object to it coming back in August, but I, I actually see two separate and yet parallel things that need to be done with our website. One is the redesign to bring up the fixed ADA issues, and one is looking at focus groups and looking at roadblocks and looking at the user ends. I, I think they can be done in a parallel way, and I think that we could... Either we could vote if people if people want to vote to approve the funding for this to go forward, or it to, for this piece to go forward and then come back and redefine what the next step is, or we could push the whole thing off till next month and do it. I don't know if the month difference is going to make a huge difference in your timeline. Um, no, I mean I think 
I agree with what you're saying. I mean, August is obviously a yeah. busier time, busier time frame. Uh, that product, is a concern. Right? So, mm -hmm. so the last two weeks in August, you know, to, to get ready to come back and present is not probably the best time for our department to do that, just yep. because of the start of school. Of course. Um, so, I mean, to me, I, I foresee, uh, you know, I hate to say the word subcommittee, but yeah. Subcommittee is where we're going. <laughs> so, it's a big thing. It's it one, a it's one thing. Sure. Years, it affects yeah. everybody in the community. Yeah. This yeah. is a very large, um, yeah. it might be small money, but it's a very big uh, Oh, yeah, I, I agree with you. So, I think to me, I guess if we could get some consensus around starting a subcommittee so that we can get the members involved and then start to have some initial discussions about what directions we want to go, and it could be process discussions. And that would eventually lead into a redesign. Um, that way, all the people are on board, and we're we're doing that together as a group. And it's not me and someone else making decisions um, by myself, and then coming back, and then you guys saying, "Well, why don't you do X, Y, and Z? Why don't we all get together and decide what we want to do, and then do it?" Yeah. So, Nancy, if if you if I may, just one point. I think, um, I don't know if it was me or you and I, we had put together a presentation that had talked about some of the issues around the website overall, not just the school committee menu items which we reviewed mm -hmm. in the past. And I think topmost was the ADA compliance, mm -hmm. but there was also recommendation on the composition of what the subcommittee could look like. And we have kind of held off on it because you had felt that there are some self-identified issues mm -hmm. that you would like to be addressed before we move forward with the overall subcommittee and you know it can be frustrating when you already know some of the issues and uh, we are spending time to say is that done is that done Correct. right so that was the reason why we had held off on it mm -hmm. so i'm wondering should we relook at that and and you know talk about the work that has already been done because there's some work that, and thought that has gone in mm -hmm. right so bringing it back if we are moving in the direction of forming a subcommittee i think that's something important but if you have thoughts around the self-identified issues, and if this is solving that self-identified issue, um, then I would say that the presentation in August, which has some depth, and that the 17,000 is helping towards that, that would be great. And at that time, we can also review, is there a subcommittee that we need to form? Are we ready to form that? What would it take? What are the goals, et cetera? So again, back to your point, there are parallel threads. Parallel and, and parallel and connected. I, I am hearing though that August is a difficult time. Is right. if we is it better for you if we push that till September? Is that I mean, is there a better if we if we either act today or move to September and skip August altogether? Um, and I guess in in terms of understanding what would happen in September, you would just want to go over specific challenges of the website, issues with the website, and then start to identify um, current processes in place that are helping provide content to the website and the possible changes, or what, I guess that's where I would struggle with. What actually do you want to know in September? I can um, share my thoughts, uh, whether it's August or September, and again, thinking on the fly a little bit here, right? So there are issues that are identified, self-identified, right. right? We all know about the broken links, challenges, content management, what have you, mm -hmm. right? So of the self-identified items, what is the plan and what is the path and timelines that you're thinking, sure. right? And along the way, what are the resources that you need, whether it is a 17,000, whether it is a 60,000 webmaster, do you need them today? Do you need it, you know, maybe five months down the line? So kind of a plan on most of the self-identified issues. And then from your perspective itself, where is it that you want the community input? And that's where we want to make sure that we are able to bring in the subcommittee. And we can talk about it from that perspective. Um, Does Blackboard offer um, process design consultation? Do they have a service that would, uh, that would help talk to them with process I, design? They, they might, and they might just turn around and say they're their implementation is their process design if I can ask them I don't know if I should well, but well then to that point do they have like a recommended set of procedures like do they have you know um they they do and I'll 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 see if I can get a, a digital copy and they can share it with the committee I'm sure they have it whether it fits what we're talking about we can figure that out what may elevate the issue of like does their design 
do they expect a, a successful user implementation to include a webmaster? You know, that might come forward. Like, I don't know. Like, yeah. it'd be interesting to know, ideally, they, of course, do this all the time, right. district upon district. So, in successful implementations, what are the best practice procedures that what right. could recommend? Because maybe, okay. maybe it would save us a lot of work. Sure. I mean, instead of starting with, like, a blank sheet, which was always fun. Because, I mean, I'm sure we, we know a lot, a lot of things. I'd hate to see you try to fix things in the old solution. We know we want to move to a new solution. Like, I almost want to freeze, you know, where we are so you don't waste your time fixing things if in six months we're going to have a new thing. Yeah, I'm not spending a lot of time at the moment fixing yeah. things on the website. Okay. I mean, that's already kind of happened a little bit over the last year. You know, so, um, A, I can, to answer your question, I can get that information for you. I do know some of that is a part of the implementation. So, for example, I know that you know they'll they'll look at Google Analytics and figure out okay what pages are really like active and yeah. what pages and they'll look at those analytics and start to use that data right. to right. figure out okay well this page isn't even hasn't been touched right. why move this page forward or even re redesign that page yeah. so they're going to start with some analytics to do that so I know there are steps yeah. in place yeah. uh, I just don't have the whole gamut uh, okay. in front of me so I'll get that for you and then we can maybe have a follow up conversation. But I guess um, my second thought is just, to me, I, I think, I kind of know mentally what those challenges are to the current website. And I, I think I'm prepared to kind of steer a committee around those challenges and move forward. I guess, it, to me, it would make sense to have some meetings and have a subcommittee if possible, work up that plan, work up those details, and then present back in September about the direction we'd like to go versus me individually coming up and saying, all right, this is what we want to do. Because I'm not going to be That's in, great, in any different place right. mentally. Right. So why don't Now we, versus is September, I think we're just going to be a month a month behind. Would it help um, if we, sh oh, sorry. No, no, it's fine. If we shifted the motion here to, uh, to approve the creation of a subcommittee and okay. we take two school committee members, we already do have some people who have self-identified as being interested. Yeah, I mean, hopefully we're all interested in school sure. interested in working in some of the weeds a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And if there are other people that seem like it would make sense to pull along for the meetings and the ride there, that that group be empowered to include people in that conversation and then come back in September for whatever it is that you need sure. as a group from us. Yeah. Does good. that make sense? And I, makes sense to me. Um, off the top of my head, I know, Mina, you had been in that and I, I, I know Meg, you had expressed interest in talking about the school committee pages in particular. I don't know if you're interested in working on the or if Amanda. Amanda, is seem, I, Amanda seems I very interested. Do it, yeah. It, yeah. Does that work for you? That works great for me. If the two of it, so the sure. the motion would be to approve the creation of a subcommittee on the website to include school committee members um, Nina and Amanda. Would be the motion I'm seeking. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Yes. So, thank you very much for all your time. No problem. And thank you. I, I think that provides you with what you sure. need. Yeah, I think it's the best approach to get what the community needs. Yeah. Excellent. That's great. Thank, thank you so you. much. Okay, so that moves us on then to the, um, the use of the Apple computer equipment for the one-to-one -one laptop program. Thank you. Um, so as you know, that each year the ninth grade class um, gets the, their uh, MacBooks for the one-to-one -one program. So we go out to bid for a lease to procure those um, units. And we actually ask for a specification on two models so that families have a choice of which model they get to choose. Um, the detail of the hardware specs are in the memo that, that you have. Um, so there will be approximately 205 units, that's the estimate. And currently, or the only um, bid that we received was from Apple. So the bid prices that came in was the unit cost of $1,389.27 for the MacBook Pro and $791.95 for the MacBook Air. So the school department pays the lease and the parents um, are set up on a payment plan and so they make their payments over time and then as seniors, if they choose to keep the laptop, um, they would pay the dollar uh, 
buyout and plus the sales tax that is applicable. And all of these include insurance and maintenance and all of it. So, so if there's a problem with the computer, other than it being smashed on purpose. Right, so there, yeah, so there is, um, and Ashok could speak to it um, better than I can, but there, there is insurance um, to a point. We have a, um, you know, we do the repairs in-house on, on a lot of the units as well. Okay, and that doesn't cost the parents anything. Sorry for asking, not earlier, I just, it just occurred to me. No, that's okay. Um, not initially, you know, if it becomes um, self-induced damage. Sure. Um, I think they're covered. That's reasonable. For some. <laughs> okay. Um, but then it does go back to parents. Okay. The only question I have is looking on the form here, it looks like the buyout date is after these kids will have graduated by about six months or five months. The buyout is 11-1-2022, and I believe this class graduates in uh, June of 2022. So I, would, I would have to, um, I haven't seen okay. this, so the tech okay. department puts yep. this together. Yep. Oh, that's I, I think the November we the date due dates have been shifted to November to ease the burden of people that are also paying other fees that are due in May. But the buyout probably should be collected before they graduate. And I, and I will say that that they do. So this this form maybe sorry, need to be adjusted. What's the difference between the two sides? I'm confused. There, no. The numbers are different. And I'm not sure what I'm looking. At. I can tell you that. I'm sorry. So. On the side where Model 1 MacBook Air 13 inch says 1,027, yep. that was the guesstimate that we sent out to parents based on prior, prior pricing. Okay. So on the first, yes. So on the other side, you can see that there is the final pricing. Okay. So both of those, the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro, have gone down just a smidge. Okay. Not very much. Okay. Thank you. So. If there are any questions or comments on that, we can take those. Or if not, we will go ahead. Um, do anything. I, my only thought um, was that ninety-eight percent of what our high school students do with their machines is on Google. Mm -hmm. um, so if I had a brief moment where I was thinking, "Gee, at what point do we not really need a, a laptop?" I mean, a, a MacBook is fine, um, but based on what my two high schoolers have done right. with their MacBooks, it's pretty much nothing I couldn't do on this. Sure. You know, or a Chromebook or whatever. It's mostly Google based. But the cost isn't I mean if you buy the lower end it's not, you know, so great. But I'm just wondering in the future if we want to discuss at what point um, we can go with the lower end machine. Because a lot of students when they go to college, especially if you're going into engineering or you need to buy something it's not, this isn't going to go with you into college forever, depending on what you study. It, they last for a long time, but it, it's maybe a future conversation, not for this year. but Not for this year. And I, I do don't have the statistics offhand, but there are some kids who purchase their own that don't have to bring, they, they, but students are not by any means have to lease these. No, they bring right. their own device. Yeah, yeah. bring their own. But it, it is worth a conversation at a later date to discuss yeah. which models are being leased. I think for now we have to stick with what yeah. what we have in front of us. But, um, yeah. All right, in that case I would uh, seek a motion to approve the lease of the Apple computer equipment for the one-to-one -one laptop program. So moved. Second? I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Any opposed? Okay. And it is unanimous and so carries. And that moves us into school bus parking lot bids. Thank you. Um, so as you know, uh, at town meeting we were appropriated 400000 for the school bus parking lot. Um, when we went out to bid, the bids came in, uh, the low bid was 492677 Um and, and as you know, the, the timing for building this bus parking lot is extremely tight. The, in putting in the school bus parking lot, there were two things that became um, important to us. One was being able to negotiate that transportation contract down by an additional 50000 because the buses would be located within Hopkinton. And the other piece to that is the town would also um, be receiving excise taxes of 50000 But to the school committee, that 50000 reduction in, contra in contract is built into the FY19 um, budget. 
So a couple of options um, in order to continue to move forward. Um, we could dismiss the bids. We could go out to bid again and try to get a lower bid um, and build in the summer of 19. We would incur that 50000 cost because we would not be able to reduce our contract. And there is always the risk that the bid will not be lower. Um, so that is one option. Uh, the other option is to um, authorize me and our engineer to negotiate with, uh, with the contractor. And just also bearing in mind that we will incur that 50000 in cost if we do not build. So if we were to shift that to cover some of this overage and then looking at the other revolving account, which would be the um, uh, parking revolving, um, and use that to uh, cover the total overage. Um, so that's what I'm looking to discuss with the committee today in order to gain a direction to move um, this parking lot. I agree with option number two. I, I like option number two, but I like your recommendation at the bottom because I feel like it opens us up to potentially getting a better price and getting the job done this year as opposed to wait until next year. Mm -hmm. My only question, and again, if they came to me before today, I would have emailed them to you, but they're coming to me right now, I'm sorry. Um, it, it, it's it, to authorize it, it to new, renegotiate the price and hold on some elements that are not crucial. Do you have in mind, right. off the top of your head, any elements that would be deemed not crucial? Well, so one of the things that we did is we changed the grading for instance, of the parking lot. The initial plan was to have the um, grading all pitched toward the back of the lot and we created a swale that then drained into the current detention pond. What we've done now is we've kind of folded the parking lot so the drainage comes to the middle and so we're, we would be able to eliminate that swale which reduces the amount of stone. So. You know, it's Does it create a pond in the middle of the parking lot. No, there's a drain. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> All, right. No. All right. There's yeah, something it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it doubles as a hockey rink. Right so okay. it's just looking at you know looking at all the elements and what can we do differently to try to bring costs down. Okay. And, and that was one that that we've already come up with. Okay. Um, so that that's a for instance. Okay. Are there any landscaping elements that um, were folded into the design to like? Beautify that would be taken out. So we did one? not. So we did not put in landscaping elements okay. um, in this. It really was the, the focus. Really was on the parking lot. Okay. Um, so and as you can see, coming in over the appropriation, landscape design or anything such as that would have to be you know a further appropriation. We could always go to town meeting next year, but it's not an element that we're removing from this bid. Okay. Susan, one question, you know, I was trying to um, go over my, uh, out my memory a little bit. Wasn't this the item that we had tried to actually bring it down to 320 in the no. last budget, you know, and then we brought it back to 400 in the capital articles? No, this, this originally the estimate was 350 and we went up to 400. Okay. So this this one we didn't so, try to so, bring down. So 350 went to 400. Right. I'm just wondering. It's you know nearly 25 percent over the budgeted. Mm -hmm. um, so if you sat down with negotiation for negotiation, um, you know what would it take? And I'm just wondering why is it so off? What were your thoughts on it? Um, so in in looking at the prices, um, a lot of it was on target. You know according to our engineer. Um, some of it is making sure that we're in compliance with stormwater um, runoff. So there, there's different elements that you have to go through that came in, you know, in terms of actual design to be in compliance are higher than what our original budget was. So not the fault of the contractor, more in terms of being in compliance with, you know, conservation, stormwater runoff, and all, all those items. What was the um, range of bids? Well, like how far below? Like was there a big range, or did this seem there was a big, there was uh, no there was a big range. Um, let's see. So the low bid, like I said, was four hundred ninety-two thousand, and our high bid was seven hundred and fifty-seven thousand. Wow. 
So it is a big range. So what you have, um, you know, in the construction industry, it really becomes who has work and who does not have work. So if somebody is fully scheduled out um, right until the blacktop plants close in October, November, they're going to throw a high number at it because they already have the work. Mm -hmm. And if they happen to get the bid, it's just, you know, money in their pocket because they threw a huge margin at that. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody who's a little bit tighter, has room in their schedule, may be more competitive. So, such as construction. So, go ahead. I, my concerns with waiting would be about the safety of the design. I mean, part of why we did this was not just to bring money back into the town, but because of the flow of traffic. And as we can all see, they are starting with the things on Hayden Road mm -hmm. imminently. So I, my preference would be to go with trying to negotiate to bring the price down a little mm -hmm. bit, but to move forward with it at this point. Yeah. The question I have is, is this set with the planning board approval so that we're ready after we've made a decision to move forward? So unfortunately, you know, the, the timing of this again, you know, timing is everything. So it's, it's approved at the Maytown meeting. We put in all our documents to be on the June meeting for both planning and conservation and we got bumped from both. So we ended up in July for both planning and conservation and both meetings have been continued. So we still have two more meetings for both planning and conservation. Planning is Monday. Okay. Most of what we are doing is outside of conservation's uh, jurisdiction, if you will. Okay. I, I'm, I'm using the wrong word, so I don't want to offend <laughs> conservation. Um, we're not within the wetland. We're part of it is within the buffer zone, I think is the actual terminology. Okay. Um, so if, if the school committee was to approve tonight, um, we're looking for planning to approve Monday okay. and then we could begin to stage the contractor could begin to procure um, we could put a shovel in the ground outside of the buffer zone so there are okay there are certain things that we could begin to move forward and mobilize to try to hit our window what's the drop dead date that we have to get final approval in order to be done in order to get the bus is parked there to get the $50,000. The contract right now has substantial completion by September 1st. So um, it is estimated to be a four week project, which could easily be a six week project. Okay. So the sooner we get a shovel in the ground, um, the more chance we have of getting closer to that timeline. And the, the 50,000, like the need to park elsewhere, is that something that we can kind of get prorated benefits on? Like we so, it's on a, so it's on a daily basis. Okay. So each day that, it's it's credit. So each okay. day that the buses are not here is okay. dollars we will not get of that 50. But that's good in a way. So if we're close, we're not quite, we don't lose the whole 50. Exactly. We still get some. Okay. Right. Okay. Yep. Okay, in that case, um, I, I would seek a motion to approve the Director of Finance to negotiate with the low bidder R.A. Hammond Construction and to appropriate up to an additional $92,677.50 from the school bus revolving and parking lot revolving accounts and accept the bid for the school bus parking lot. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, so it, and I am a yes, so it so carries and is unanimous. It, at this point, I am going to recommend that we take out of order, because we are we're a little bit behind on our schedule, the diversity survey um, that is scheduled uh, as part of uh, letter K to get the culture and diversity survey presentation in to make sure we get it in before lunch. We don't break for lunch and have our meeting with our attorney because we will need to stop and meet with the attorney when she comes because we're paying her time. We don't want to pay her time <laughs> we're not meeting with her. Uh, but I do want to make sure I know that there's some community interest in this and I want to make sure that we are able to have this part of the meeting televised. Is that acceptable? Yes, that's a fantastic idea. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Okay. No. Okay. 
All right, so you will recall as long ago as December during the superintendent search, one of the things that I continued to express to the community that I thought we needed to think about was our changing demography. You know, we have, I think, very you know, different culture and diversity than we had probably a decade ago. And one of the things that I had pulled up on here for the purposes of our survey today, looking at this anyway, was the um, enrollment data for the town of Hopkinton. So this is where we were in 1718. You can see that currently, or in the last school year, um, we were 79.8% white. So this is the very first year we have um, gone below 80%. Uh, and you can kind of see what that demography looks like in very broad brush strokes, right? But I think that, you know, sometimes we have these categories and it places people into these categories, but what we don't really think is that you know these things are really true representations of the people who inhabit our schools and who live inside the boundaries of Hopkinton. So I got together with, first with Josh Hanna, um, as a person who taught journalism for a number of years and someone who's been teaching at Leslie for a very long time. And Leslie, I think, prides itself on you know the work that it does around diversity and the diversity of its teaching staff. Uh, we felt like we were probably a good duo to start the process of looking at this survey. Since that time, it's probably been vetted by at least 30 district leaders. So people have looked at it in various settings and venues. Um, some of the stuff that we have done in terms of thinking about the ways in which we wanted to go about this, we did look at some of the ADL questions, um, and we have done some work already with Khalees Warnham, who will be doing work with our district over the next year. Um, I know that one of the concerns that the HGC has had is that um, we haven't invested in um, looking at diversity work. So the work that we'll be doing with Khalees will, you know, at a minimum be around $6,000. It will, you know, probably go up from there. But we have professional development money for our admin team, and that's how we're choosing to spend it this year. So I think what's important to notice is this very first paragraph, and that's why I have it on the screen. Um, when parents receive this, they will get information that lets them know um, that the survey is part of an effort to help us understand how parents and guardians feel about their kids' experiences in our school district. And we explain that given Hopkinton's rapidly changing demography, the school district wants to best address the needs of our diverse population of learners. We go on to tell them that we are embarking upon the development of a new strategic plan and any information provided in this survey will be used to inform that plan or may be used to inform that plan if we don't get the information that we need. Um, there will be, as we say in that first paragraph, um, more surveys. So what we are thinking, and this is probably a very baseline survey, it's that first thing that will go out in a series of surveys. All right, so I guess the question then becomes sort of why the rush, right? And uh, we are in a position now where Khalees Warnham is coming to work with us in August. She will be with us for the full day on August 15th. And we would like to have some data to use as an administrative team for that event. Uh, when I used to teach journalism, the statistic that they would give to us is they would say, if you get 20% of your population in terms of respondents, you probably have a very good picture of what the entire community thinks. Uh, Susan suggested the other day that you'd be very lucky when you get 30% of your population responding to any kind of a survey that goes out. But when we looked at this as an admin team, Ashok reassured us that Hopkinton is usually very good about responding to surveys, and we will certainly get better than 30%. I know that people are worried about this happening during the summer months, and you know I also have that concern. But if we don't have this data going forward for August, then we don't sort of have, but we're sort of operating with hypotheses as opposed to something that would be more real. So that's one of the reasons for uh, sort of our big rush with this. Um, and I, I do think that this, when you see the survey, I think you'll think that it's very baseline and that you know once we get sort of going with this, that we will you know certainly have to mind the community for more information. All right, the, the next part of this, we just asked folks to, you know, sort of just go with their gut. What are your thoughts and your feelings, your own personal experiences within the school, your perception of your kids' experiences? What you are seeing is the parent survey. What we are hoping to do is also send a survey to our kids who are in probably grades 7 to 12. 
because we think that they are certainly mature enough and experienced enough to be able to answer these kinds of questions from a student perspective. And I think lots of times there is a disconnect between what kids experience and what they've shared with their parents. So we think that the student voice is equally important. Are you going to send it to the um, faculty as well, do you think? Oh, we haven't thought about doing a faculty one, but probably. It makes, I mean, makes sense. Sorry, sorry yeah. to hurry off. But no, that's all right. Yeah. You know, I had only thought really about looking at parent and student experiences right, right now. It, is it possible to send it to recent alum families? Oh, I would think so. Sure. Because people have been in high school the past four years but just graduated. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. a good idea, actually. Yeah. 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 Why not? Why not? I mean, I would guess, too, that there would be lots of high school families who currently have students in the high school, but who also have students who are alums. But I'm not averse to it. I think the recent, alum, the recent alums themselves, I think, mm -hmm. um, leave this environment, often go to a very diverse collegiate environment, and they reflect back. Right. And a lot of that first freshman year, I think, from my own um, anecdotal experience, has been is very reflective for the students mm -hmm. yes. and puts in context their experiences. And it might be interesting to hear from... Mm -hmm. The student alums. So because we tell people that our survey is completely anonymous, we uh, allow them to put their name if they so choose. There are some people who would like to, I'm sure. Uh, but if you don't, that is perfectly fine. And then we got to a place of respondent self-identification. And one of the things that uh, Josh and I thought about was, if you give people a checklist and ask them to sort of uh, fit themselves into a box, labels very often falsely identify people. And so we eliminated that. We took away any kind of a checklist there. Um, and another thing that we were thinking is that, you know, sometimes when we decide to put labels on things, you know, we are inadvertently and subtly or maybe even significantly, you know, imposing this power construct that we don't want to do. So what we have done is we have left all of these first uh, questions as very optional. So. Uh, the first one says, in terms of race, I identify as. And what that allows people to do is to put short ins or text in there or eliminate it entirely if they don't think about themselves, you know, sort of uh, racially. They may think of themselves as a gendered human being, but not a race, you know, not in terms of their own race, right? Like that's how do people think about themselves. So if you are a person who said, you know, I am white, but I am married to someone black and my children present as black children. Right? They could put that in the short answer text. Or in terms of religion, you could have someone who says, you know, I am Jewish, uh, my husband is non-religious, my children are being raised Jewish. And that could fit in there. Um, if you are a person who never thinks of yourself in terms of religion, you know, I'm Lutheran, but I never think of myself as Lutheran, leave it blank. We ask about socioeconomics, and then we also say if there's any other way in which you self-identify and you would like to indicate that here, please do. We like leaving that very broad because as people go through and continue to answer questions, if we want to go back and see how that respondent self-identifies, that's going to be very helpful to us, especially as we, inform, we establish subgroups and establish a group to construct our strategic plan. Um, so, Carol, if a parent is responding, uh, I respond for myself, mm -hmm. correct? How I identify myself? Correct, yes. Okay. okay. All right. So, then where we go is we ask people um, in check boxes, where do your kids fall in the Hopkinton Public Schools? So, if you have a kid in the middle school in Hopkins, you'll just check those two boxes. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Based on Mina's question, um, those first few questions about ethnicity, mm -hmm. race, religion, um, based on the things that you said, for examples of, mm -hmm. of possible responses, if you um, change the, if you were to think about changing the question from I, I self-identify as, in, instead of that, say I self-identify my family as, or I guess self-identify isn't the correct word, or maybe it is, I don't know, help an English teacher. But if you're looking for a broader view of their family as a whole, with the example of, you know, my husband is black, I am white, my children present as black, that's mm -hmm. more of the family structure as opposed to just the individual structure. So if I saw it as I self-identify as 
Mm-hmm. I would choose my ethnicity as opposed to my family, family as a whole. Good point. Okay. So, anyway, your question made me think of that. Yeah. So, I, I don't I'll know if that's what you're trying to get. To get self and family right. incorporated into right. that. Right. That's okay. okay. So then we just get to a place where we ask if uh, we feel like we're doing a good job of encouraging all families to engage in and attend school events. And we have that one in there because we think that there may be some families who feel a little bit disenfranchised, right? And, you know, we don't have any idea why they feel disenfranchised, maybe because English is not their first language, maybe because they are... um, they feel that they are socioeconomically disconnected from a, a large part of the town. Maybe they just feel like the school has been uninviting. So uh, that will at least get us to a place where we can have a sense of um, who is answering never and how many percentages of people who are answering always and often. So do you, you are able to ask, answer this based on their perception of the school's effectiveness in, what, in, in including people, or do you want them to base it on their own experience? Like their own I experience. personally feel included, because yes. it says, my school starts to encourage all families. I think it's my family. My school, my high school strives to encourage my family to engage. Am I, ask, are you, am I answering for myself, or am I projecting what I perceive to be the general? I think the latter. I think I would be interested in thinking about what a particular family thinks about inviting all families in. I mean, that's just conjecture, really. Like, I could answer, I mean, I might answer that, you know, often. Mm -hmm. I personally might feel like always, but I might answer often or occasionally because I know of a few people. Like, I'm not sure, Mm -hmm. I don't know how Mm -hmm. accurate that response is going to be. I don't know, just... I think you add another statement. My child's school strives to encourage my family. Right. So that's what I was wondering. Is yeah. it my family or is it all families? And, and I'm sure there have been studies done about the positioning of the responses always at the top. Is it the likelihood that that's what they're going to check? Those people kind of racing through it instead of putting never at the top? We went through that. We actually had uh, never at the top for some, always at the top for others, and then we were advised to d- use the same throughout. Okay. Yeah. But doesn't this gear it towards a positive response? Not every question is framed in a positive way. I think the right. That so too. that's it why we have the question. flipped them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the my child's school strives to encourage all. I believe, and I'm not 100% sure, that we pilfered that from a nationally vetted survey. Okay. So, but I mean, we, can, we can take a look at it. If we get a representative sample, if our 20% or our 30% respondents are representative of the demographics you put up there, 70% white, whatever, right. then if you answer for your own family, it'll be more meaningful for the town as a whole. But if our 30% are all sort of white respondents who speak English, Mm-hmm. then answering for my own family is not going to be representative of what you're looking for. The, it w- would require an awareness of what the community is experiencing in order to answer the way it's written. I don't know. Right. I'm not sure. I don't know. Will we... I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, don't I guess know. I just wonder about the family who perceives that some people are invited in more often than other families are invited in. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I know, I thought that we're going to go over this and then ask questions since it's open. I'll oh, sure. ask this question. Um, what's the primary goal of the SWIS survey? Oh, so, and I suppose that goes back to what we had said at the very beginning. Um, at this point, we are really just trying to understand our demography and how to meet, meet the needs of our population. But really what we're doing is thinking about this in terms of the strategic plan. I mean, I think that it's twofold. So one, the information we get here is going to help guide the administrators' work this year. Okay. So how is it going to fall right back into our schools so that administrators know what we need to work on and we start working on it and we bring it back into our five buildings, right? So I think that's what we mean about addressing the needs of a diverse population of learners. And secondly, on a much more global level, we are putting together a strategic plan that will you know, carry us for five years. And so how are we going to make those two things happen? And I, as I said, this is very baseline. This is the very first dipstick. This is just sort of global, and there's a whole lot more work to be done beyond this. Sure. Um, the other question I have is when you are seeking responses which are open and rich, I, I personally like 
because when I see race as Asian, I feel I'm South Asian. Mm -hmm. Because when people think right. of Asian, it's a different view. Yeah. Yeah. So I like that, to have that option. Uh, and I hope someone somewhere changes the form to add South Asian. Right. Uh, although sometimes I wonder, why do we need all of this human check? Right. Uh, but anyhow, um, back to the open-ended ones. Mm -hmm. When you collate that data, and I speak from a data management perspective, when you have these varied responses, mm -hmm. collating could be, become a challenge when you have someone who hasn't typed, you know, a S or has mistyped mm -hmm. or has added a lot. How, you know, I, I hope you have those plans in place that when you have all of this written by people, how would that be collated? Right, so I think that when we, when we looked at some of the it was really important to us not to lock people into boxes, sure. right? No, I think that's a great idea. Uh, so then when we gather some of this data and we come to, you know, uh, a response that's really unique, we'll be able to kind of go back and say, okay, this is respondent number 649. Let's see how that person self-identifies, right? And then that might be, and it would be wonderful if respondent number 649 also offered a name because there may be people that we want to reach out to and say, you know, you've had these experiences, I'd love to learn more about them. I mean, I don't think it precludes us doing case study research as well as the kind of more global research that says, you know, 69% of the people have said that their children have been harassed in our public schools, right? And, um, you know, in terms of self-identification, maybe these are things that will come for the down for children, um, you know, the gender identity, is that something that you're looking at uh, for, for the self? Will it come later? Or is it more focused towards the kids? Um, again, I, I'm happy to wait till you finish it all okay. and then ask. All right, so we'll go to the next question. Um, I believe that students in Hopkinton treat one another with respect. That's just us taking our own temperature to see you know, how are we doing in, in that sense, right? Do we, do we think our kids are respectful to one another? My child. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, again, you know, as a parent, um, I wouldn't be able, I think it's a good question for the staff and perhaps the students themselves, but it may not apply as a parent. So is there an option to you can leave not them applicable? Blank. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, my child has witnessed language or behaviors that have been hurtful to others. Yes or no? And if you answered yes above, how long ago did that occur? Can any child say no to that question? I mean, they're children. There's always like... This is the parent survey though, right? Right. Will, mm -hmm. it, be di will it be different for the kids or are you going to send the kids to say Well, that? I think one of the reasons why we liked this question, uh, and if you answered yes above, how long ago did that occur? One of the things that I would like to tease out of this is, are these things primarily happening in sort of grades three, four, and five? Because there's a host of research to support the fact that while kids may recognize in grades K and one that you look different from the way I look, or you speak differently from the way I speak, uh, by the time they get to grades three, four, and five, if they haven't had formal education around this, and most of these children have not had formal education, then they sort of speak out. And they may say things that are hurtful or inappropriate or those kinds of things to other children. And I just wanted to sort of find out if we have a spike in those grade levels. Because if we have a spike in those grade levels, it's going to help us to understand where and when we have to start the instructional process. So it's, it might be looking like it's just a vague question, but there's sort of a method to our madness there. But it could be like, you wear glasses. I mean, yes. I, I mean, yeah. it could be, you know, your, mm -hmm. your dress is an ugly green, or, you know, it, they're kids, so I don't know. It's interesting. I mean, yeah. It'd be interesting to see how this plays out. Uh, so then we say, if, yes, the nature of these hurtful words and behaviors have been based in, and we put race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, body type, socioeconomic status, intellectual ability, phys phys intellectual ability and physical ability, or other. So all of those are there. Um, we, we kind of thought we might have all the bases covered there, but we are pretty sure that there'll be something else, like an ugly green dress, for example, that, that might have to hit other, right? But I'm hoping that that's helpful to us because I think that um, 
all of those things happen and very frequently as a district we think about things like race or religion like we think about those big hitters but I think that we also have to think about things like body type or intellectual ability right because those really? things are happening to our kids very frequently and that's I think a part of the race and divulture and uh, <laughs> race culture and diversity uh, instruction that we need to do in our schools. Can I just see the question? Again? Oh yes. Thank you. Oh, it should say has been based, right? What about social ability? Because that's yeah, different from yeah. intellectual and physical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And sure. Social big, and right? emotional. I mean, I, I have many challenges in terms of social ability. So it was one but of the first things. I would include of. emotional, social, and yeah. emotional. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Definitely. I'm so glad you're sharing this with us because I know it's been a concern of the community for at least a year and a half. Um, and I know that the Hawkington Diversity and Cultural Alliance has done so much to spearhead um, administrative and community thinking about this. So I'd like to acknowledge here their efforts, um, particularly the efforts of Timoria Saba without whose influence I would not have left my house and have been here today, frankly, because I thought her work was really honest um, and necessarily fierce in bringing some of these topics into view and to our attention. And as you, as you know, Mina and I recently met with a school committee member in Framingham, Gloria Pascal, who's just such a firecracker. Um, but she was interesting about the subject of surveys because she thought that it would be important to do an audit before a survey. And maybe Mina can speak a little bit more to the specifics of why she said that. Um, because you've given us statistics about how many, you know, 0.8 black people in, in Hopkinton. But what is the percentage of students of diversity and teachers of diversity? I think there are more questions about percentages to ask that would help fill in this picture. Yeah, I, mean, I think I like that terminology on it. And uh, you know, I know this is, this is a bigger conversation that we're talking about in terms of how are we going to go about and how do we take input, whether it is HDCA's work or you know, reaching out to other districts. So happy to talk about that now or Later, uh, I just think Michelle's coming at noon. She she actually is here. Oh, okay. Uh, but okay. that, that's but that shouldn't rush. I, I do want to add in to echo some of what you said that th this is a conversation that is ongoing. This is one piece of mm -hmm. what I really hope will be a fruitful series of conversations, surveys, audits, all of that. That this work is much bigger than a one-off. It's much bigger than this conversation here, and to bring in voices of people who have lived the experience as well as people to the conversation. I think this survey in particular though is probably time sensitive for your for our work. Your yes. admin and, and, I, and I don't want to deprive get to the end. I don't want to deprive the admin work this opportunity of the survey just because we need more, because clearly right. we do need yeah. more. And, yes. and I'm happy to talk that. about yeah. it. And I don't disagree with an equity audit. You know, having talked to yeah. Dan Gudekanst and Needham, who has just undergone an equity audit, I mean, it's it's a huge undertaking, and it's a $30,000 expenditure as well, right? So we have to, I mean, I think that this is our, our sort of first step as yeah. an admin team without a strategic plan in place. Right. I mean, we could put this on the back burner, but I don't feel like it's smart it's, for us to wait. We right. need it now. We need, I, to, we need to, it, to start the beginning. Yeah. And so then we asked the same question about your child being insulted, teased, harassed, or otherwise verbally abused, and how long ago that happened. Um, and then we have three questions in a row. I believe the Hopkinton Public Schools addresses the academic needs. And our guess is the people are going to say that academically things are going fairly well. I believe the Hopkinton Public Schools addresses the social emotional needs of all learners. I'm not sure that we will get the same high marks there. And I believe the Hopkinton Public Schools appropriately addresses issues of disrespect, harassment, or bullying. And I'm not sure that we'll get the same high marks there. So we wanted to sort of see how those, all those pieces weigh out, you know, 
So one quick question, comment on the verbiage, right? Mm -hmm. So we are saying all learners. So in terms of context, I guess I'm just wondering, am I responding for my child's experience? Or, you know, I think Amanda was trying to say the same, or is it the global, when, when we say all learners, it seems like a general sentiment. Um, yeah. So maybe something to think about. Yeah, and, and again, I think I, I like the idea of, of parents thinking about, you think we're meeting the needs of all learners. And I think most parents are going to do that with their sort of gut instinct about my own kid, because that's how you look at it. Right. I think other people might think about it in, in a more global way. But, but I feel like seeking their specific um, experience and having that multitude of that, yes. that, that will give you the overall versus my perception, I think everyone's fantastic, right? So I feel that would not be an accurate representation of the experience of a parent. I agree, that's okay. good. I feel like if we get, if we are successful in getting a representative sample in our respondents, then if I answer for myself, it's true data. If it's, otherwise it's kind of conjecture or and it's not, as, it's not as reliable, it's perception. Right. That's, right. Yeah. That's right. And it may be yeah. worse than reality, or it may be better than reality. It depends on who you talk to at the bus stop two days ago. Right. You know, so I think if you answer for your own student, and we, and we get a representative sample. If we don't get a representative sample and you only answer for yourself, we need to ask again. Mm -hmm. Because it won't be, it won't be sufficient to, to base anything off of. And, and also on the academic need, while I, I like that question to be asked of people, like are your academic needs being met, can you explain the context of it in a diversity and racial survey? So I do wonder about, um, because I think that when we say diverse, we have kids who have great learning needs, we have kids who are super high achievers. We have kids who are kind of, you know, kind of hovering to hang on to meeting the basic standards, right? So all, all of those people, I think there's an intellectual diversity or prepared or a readiness diversity as well. And I think that that's, I would like to think that, you know, whether um, a student is a struggling learner or the highest achiever, that we are meeting the needs of those kids, but maybe we're not, so. Yeah, like I said, I do want to ask that question mm. generally. Yeah. 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 And I think that with the social emotional question, kids can't access a curriculum unless they feel psychologically safe to do so. Mm. Um, and um, in terms of disrespect, harassment, or bullying, I'm sure that there are some families who have had very negative experiences and some who have had very positive experiences. As a parent or guardian, I talk with my child about culture and diversity. That's sort of our, our temperature taking of our parents. Do they or don't they talk about culture and diversity at home? It's a great question. And doesn't it depend on the age of the child? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, but I think that we do it in different, different ways. ways. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Exactly. In subtle ways. Oh, I think right. yeah. 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 And I guess where you're asking for where all our children are, mm -hmm. So if you have multiple children, you're still filling that one survey, right? Mm -hmm. I do think that the, the nice thing about that question is that it, it causes whoever's taking it to think about, do I, th do I talk about this with my kids, mm -hmm. don't I? Do I talk about it enough? And to think about, like, I think about the conversations I have with my high school are, are very different than the conversations I have with my eight-year-old, but I do think that there is a place for some conversation all along the way. Sure, yeah. absolutely. And I just wonder if we, do you talk about culture and diversity, or do you talk about the differences among people? Like, I'm not sure, I'm not, like, if you say culture and diversity, you might be, people might perceive that question more narrowly than you're intending it. I don't know. I mean... I got a, someone may say yes, they may right. never talk to their child about intellectual diversity or social emotional. Right. They may talk about mm -hmm. race and they may talk about religion. They may not talk about gender or they may, you know, I don't know, socioeconomic differences mm -hmm. may not come up. So I don't know. Yeah, and I think what we called this was, uh, go all the way back to the tippy toe, uh, the diversity and acceptance. So maybe we'll talk about, maybe I'll change that one to say diversity. Oh, broader, and making it clear to the respondent that it's broad. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's very interesting too, because lots of times you talk to sort of a typical white American person and ask them about culture, and they say they don't have any. Right. right. I'm yeah, so yeah, guilty yeah. of that for the thing in Elma. I said I didn't cook anything because I don't have an ethnic right. food. And a woman from India said, I've never had certain types of American food. You could have brought that. And I was like, I know. I believe the Hopkinton Public Schools could do more to establish a sense of mutual respect and to grow kindness among its student body. I think this one is a really important question to us. Yeah. Yeah. I believe the Hopkinton Public School faculty and staff fought to foster goals of mutual respect and kindness. As a parent or guardian, I would be interested in joining a working group whose mission it is to help our students grow in their acceptance of differences and to develop a culture of kindness. Uh, please leave your name and an email address or to maintain an enemy contact the superintendent's office. And I think this is why I haven't reached out to any particular parent group because I don't feel like one parent group should be informing this survey. This is baseline, it's global, and after we have a group of people who might be interested in working with us toward that um, strategic plan, then I think that it would become important to look to people who could help us out with this stuff. Um, and if I may ask you this, uh, and you know, you're so good with words, at the very beginning you said the survey results may be used. Why did you choose may instead of will? Well, I guess if we look at a particular question and we say, okay, this question, we kind of blew it. It's not really giving us the information that we want. Yeah. Then we would take that and put it aside and go with, you know, Different. something new, right? Yeah, I mean, the likelihood is very high that many aspects of this would help us to inform what we're doing. I can't imagine that every question is not going to be helpful, but... Right. Um, and if I, if I may um, indulge a little bit on the global conversation, a little bit about HBCA and Gloria and whatnot, um, I feel it's important to hear the stories. It's very difficult for people who have been through a bad experience you will not be able to get their responses and the depth of their experience through the survey. So what are your plans around getting some of that and how are you looking to partner with some of the work that some of the other community organizations like HBCA or there are other leaders in the community who have done this work. How are you hoping to take their inputs and hearing the real stories and sitting down because that's such an important part of all of this. Well, I'm hoping that question right there is going to tease out some of those people. Mm -hmm. So I think that people who want to join this group or people who would like to add additional comments, that might be a way for us to identify people who have stories to tell. Right? I'm hoping that those last two will do that. And if they don't, that's okay. Because, you know, as we say in the beginning, this is just our first step. So once we get a group of people who say, yes, I'm interested, then you have that opportunity to sort of beat the bushes and try to find people who have experiences that they are willing to share. Right? I mean, we have loads of L families. We have loads of um, socioeconomically challenged families. Like, I think we need to hear from all of those people. See back. Parents might be interested in talking with some of yeah. I do also think that this is kind of a parallel, not parallel, but I do think this is not in lieu of other work that we may be interested in doing as a committee that has come up. Uh, that there are other ways that we can reach voices in the community. And I actually want to start off by saying I really applaud you taking this initiative head yes. on. Yeah. You know, and I know you're just starting off, even though we all feel you've been <laughs> acting, uh, and you have so much to do, so much you're learning and doing. You didn't have an assistant superintendent until recently. Um, so this is amazing that you're taking this head on. So yes. really, really appreciate that. It's wonderful. It's like the conduit has yes. opened and it's just a, a fabulous. Yes, I mean, it's a first step and there yeah. was certainly no intention to push anyone aside yes. or whatever, but you know, yeah. I mean, I think that it's difficult to invite in one group without thinking that there are so many people in our community who need to have a voice. Absolutely. So I'm soliciting voice first. No, I think that's, that's great. Good. It's very admirable. I think that there is a great interest in our community around this too. topic, which mm -hmm. you know and we all know. And 
heretofore, we're going to have wonderful conversations about it. So yes, thank this you. Thank the you. issue of our time. I, yeah, I think not just exactly. on this level, but on a larger yeah. So thank issue. you for putting it on the agenda and televising this, because it's an important step. Sorry, go ahead. Yes, just, um, the one question I didn't see, which I think is interesting, um, and relevant is has your I don't you can word it you're good with words so um, has your child um, experienced um, whatever you said about from other kids but from staff has, has there been have there been any incidences yeah. where you have your child has experienced um, insensitivity from a staff member because of a difference whether it's learning religion right yeah. so I think that there are experiences and I think it's good to surface yeah. those it's a good point great. and have you experienced yep. you. this yeah. from a staff member as a parent and the other question is um, just more broad and um, given the topic in particular is there any need to translate offer this in a translated version or to get this out to people who don't speak English because parents can't, can't read the English I will definitely have Jill work on that we have a, a list of families that need things translated so yeah. anything that goes out um, theoretically, anything that goes out should go out in that language okay. to those families. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that there may only be about 14 or 15 of those families, but we make sure that we do that because it's absolutely a violation of their civil rights not to. And are there any families that we are aware of? You probably know, and I don't. I don't need to know that that the parents wouldn't be able to receive an electronic survey. Because we are talking so that that we know of, or maybe homeless, or I don't know yeah. the demographics. And I don't really need to know, but I. I know that, like when you talk about Framingham, there are definitely people who are homeless, who are, yeah. you know, and it might be something to consider when mm -hmm. we're disseminating, providing another mechanism or specifically mailing to somebody or... Yeah. Oh, I believe it. we only have one. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, and also, in, in terms of the question, so it seems a fairly short survey, right? Yes. And where you have kept some of the demographics, you know, capturing of the individual, who it is, open-ended, um, did you consider adding some open-ended boxes around experiences? That may be a place where you will be able to collect some of the stories right there. Um, I'm just wondering if you consider that. Um, any thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, I'm not opposed to it. So, yeah, I just, I guess my concern was how much are they going to write? Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm and happy they to. they choose not to write, yeah. right? And the reason why I say this is, um, you know, I think we heard some of the community voices and some of the frustration may be coming from that they have done a lot of work on this path and this, scene, you know, that we are able to get to the heart of it and we are able to ask some of the tough questions, if you will, mm -hmm. right? And um, so just throwing it out there, for, for you to think about. Yeah, maybe I'll just and maybe that last it is question. something yeah. of stories yeah. and, you would and, like to share. Yeah. And maybe it is something you know you have plans to do in the future. I know it's very driven by your uh, professional development that's coming up. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about that and also a little bit more about the vetting process and who all was involved in the vetting process? In creating this. So after Josh and I went through that process then Jen and I went through the process, and then we took it to the admin council. So Susan, for example, was a part of that. Tim Person was a part of that. Every building principal, assistant principal. And then Josh was good enough to take it to all the SMLs over at the high school. So all of the subject matter leaders, K-12, PE, art, you know, music, technology, English, science, social studies, all of those people have had their eyes on it as well. So overall, it is about 30 people who are district leaders who have been able to take a look at that. I'm, I'm wondering if someone like Mrs. Abaraju or Mrs. Truffling, who had led uh, you know, the diversity in Elwood or the high school teacher, I forget his name, uh, who runs the club at the high school, if they were part of, a part of this at all. And I know it's, oh, it's, my it's summertime. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure um, availability may be a concern, but I'm wondering if their inputs were taken into consideration. Yeah, we usually don't call upon teachers in the summer just because they're not contracted to work during the summer. And I would imagine they're going to be involved in the next steps once of the course. information right. is gathered and we sure. get yeah. back right. together. Sure, we Again, at the face of it, I think it's just, like you said, as a starting point, that sounds great. I just feel this is such a sensitive topic 
um, that includes inclusivity right at the get-go is so important mm -hmm. and that's the reason why I'm asking that these teachers clearly have seen it and have experienced it and are passionate about it oh. so yeah I, I think that our teachers district-wide are passionate about this topic now right. okay. sure, sure. Excellent. I, I think also in terms of I think yeah, I, I hear a lot of people wanting to be including the community and we did reach back to the HDCA in May you and I to have a conversation with them the timing was not right for them at that point but it, that's it's not the end of the conversation it's this is all beginning and things moving forward that conversations need to keep happening and need to keep happening on different levels right and, and you know no disrespect there and like I said I really really appreciate you doing this and just that diversity even in the vetting process and in I feel like I, I may be I, I come from an Indian heritage another person comes from an Indian heritage but there's diversity right Absolutely. there sure. right yes. so I just want to make sure that you know even through the vetting process you've had that diverse lens mm -hmm. um, and that different viewpoints were taken into consideration I and you know you're all highly qualified you have all the experience from various districts I know you have come from Westboro where you've seen all of this and you talked about it all through um, it, it just only strengthens if you can hear a different perspective because we may simply be missing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And if we are missing things, they will come. Yeah. Yeah. We'll keep There's reaching to find that. Yes. We will yeah. keep, keep reaching for them. That's great. Yeah. Thank and you. On day one. Yeah. We are on day one in many days to come. Mm -hmm. So. That's with that, I think we should break uh, to meet with our attorney, and um, I suspect some people are hungry as well. Uh, I, I did also want to say, I, I, in the process of this conversation, I was ne negligent in not welcoming publicly uh, Jen Parsons, oh, our new you. assistant yes. superintendent. Uh, it is wonderful to have you here. I, I think I said this to you already, but every time I drive by and I see that your car is in the spot I feel like um, things are well <laughs> things are well in the district um, so the nicest thing also I've heard in a very long time that made my day thank you Jimmy. thank you for having me so. welcome thank you very thank much you. thank you very much we can break and um, I, I did see some lunch arrive for those who yes Thank you. We have just finished our lunch break and we are ready to continue back with our meeting and we will pick up with uh, item. H, which is the elementary library position um, with the Dr. Katma. Okay. What I am seeking is that the committee um, consider the hiring of a 1.0 FTE library position to be split across the Marathon Elementary School and Elmwood. Right now we have a half-time librarian at Elmwood and we have a half-time librarian at Marathon. And what's been happening is, in the other half of the time, we have a paraprofessional who presents lessons. In our negotiations with both of those, um, with, both the, with both of those associations, bargaining units, the paraprofessionals, and the teachers, what we have come to discover is that the teacher has been writing lessons for the para to implement. Technically, when a teacher writes a lesson, that teacher is only supposed to write a lesson for him or herself to implement. So for example, if I were a high school math teacher and I was teaching you know, a, three se sections of college prep algebra and two sections of honors algebra, but you thought I was a great lesson planner, you might ask me to do something in geometry or calculus, and that would be outside the scope of the five preparations that I have. So you could, I could certainly say no. Well, our librarian has been doing that you know, now for um, some time, and the pair has been implementing the lesson. So technically, it's a violation of what we ask our teachers to do. Uh, by the same token, what we've done is we've had a paraprofessional in there all by herself with you know, a whole classroom and no other adult in the room. So that really means that the paraprofessional is carrying out lessons. And while we do ask our paras to stand in from time to time, so say for example, a teacher has to leave the classroom for an IEP meeting, the para might run it, or the teacher has to step out into um, the hallway to do BAS testing or something, right? With particular students, the para might run the classroom. But that happens only at you know unusual sort of times and it's not a regular occurrence when that happens we do pay the paraprofessional an additional ten dollars um, to run the class so 
uh, we've sort of been in violation with the para association or union as well. So what we have looked at is eliminating two half-time para positions and just bringing in a full-time librarian. What we think there is there will be more equity in terms of the education the kids are getting. So we will all be taught by a licensed librarian as opposed to having some kids taught by a paraprofessional and some kids taught by a licensed educator. And what we're hoping to do also is to sort of bolster the library programming that we have. So how do you get information? How do you use information? How do you convey information? And we believe that that can start as early as, you know, those primary grades in kindergarten and grade one. And I mean, if anyone was sort of privy to some of the research projects that even our third graders have done this year, you know, that inquiry-based sort of thing, that's one of the things that, you know, is part of our, our librarian's goals. So. Uh, while it is an additional approximately $35,000 added to the budget this year, what we're hoping is to be able to get all of our, our kids from K to 5 to have an actual library and teaching those courses. Okay. Now, Dr. Kavner, is it that uh, what was the first priority? Was the first priority to make the library position full time? Or was it more to, we don't need the part-time paraprofessional? I'm just trying to understand if what drove, what drives this decision back to why take one from the other and first understand the need and try to fulfill that. So is the need there today for the full-time librarian? Well, in some ways we were violating both contracts, okay. the Paris contract and the teacher contract. Um, so we were asking them to do things that went beyond the scope of the contract. Uh, but I think that, you know, this is also like sort of an equity issue. And then the last piece of this, which I haven't yet mentioned, is that we use library as a special, right? So when a K-5 to teacher gets a preparation period, the kids will go to art or to music or to PE or to library. So every kid has to go to library. It's just what would the quality of the instruction be during that class period. Okay, I see. And, and you know, in general, I'm a big proponent of libraries. And I'm just wondering, as a town also, we are investing a lot in our library and mm -hmm. extending hours and what have you. Um, is there any room for collaboration there? And does that go beyond uh, you know, what's being done here. Can you speak a little bit to that? Well, that is a delightful question, Mina, and I'm really happy that you asked that question. Uh, when, in my previous district, the school librarians and the town librarian had, like, kind of an amazing collaboration that went on, and Maureen Ambrosino, who is the town librarian, was actually on the state board that put together some of those, um, you know, sort of library goals and standards for kids in Massachusetts public schools. Um, there is a document that I can share with the committee if you're interested in seeing that, but she is a public librarian who did that work sort of on the school side, right? So yes, there certainly is a whole lot that can be done between the schools and the public library. And in fact, I think it might be tomorrow, or maybe it's Thursday, that I'm actually meeting with Heather at the public library. Oh, that's, yeah. great. that's great. That's fantastic. I can't remember what day it is. Did What's I just say, is it required for certification that a school have a certified library? Is well, <laughs> I want to understand the requirements for the school. We have to have a library. Currently, um, our high school librarian has sort of stepped out of that role and has moved more to a technology education role. But our fear is that when NIESC comes in to do our reaccreditation, um, there will be a problem if we don't have a high school librarian in, in place. Yes, it's an optional that. discipline. It's a, it's a core, core discipline, really. Sort of theoretically, yes. Okay. Yeah. Like, there are schools that don't have them, and NIESC will come in and say, you should get yourselves a librarian. Um, and it can, in fact, impact your accreditation. But I do think that, you know, based on, on I guess the role that a librarian will take on and the degree to which they really want to move kind of inquiry-based projects and, you know, a lot of that media literacy and how do I acquire information from different sources and how do I make meaning of that information and convey that information in ways that are appropriate. Uh, you know, librarians can do amazing things when, when we get them to that place. Other questions or comments? Okay. And hearing none, I will seek a motion to approve an elementary librarian at 1.0 FTEs in lieu of two part-time paraprofessional positions. So moved. Second. 
there a second? Second. Second by Mina. Uh, all those in favor? Yes. Aye. And I am a yes as well, so that carries unanimously. The next item on our agenda is vacation time for our 12-month secretarial staff. Dr. Kavanaugh. Okay. So currently, the 12-month secretarial staff contract uh, reads that when a secretary starts in the district, they get two weeks of vacation time. And that doesn't become three week, weeks vacation time until they have been employed here for a full five years. So on the first day of their sixth year, they would have three weeks vacation. And in some ways, we kind of felt that that was a little bit archaic because it gives them a very long time to get to three weeks vacation. And so the administrative team in this building at a central office meeting sort of put our heads together and thought about the ways in which we could up that a little bit so that our secretarial staff could enjoy more vacation time. And what we decided might make sense is if we um, front-loaded one additional vacation day on each of those days between the uh, first year and the fifth year. So that, um, you know, you get 11 days, then 12 days, then 13 days, and um, by the time they got to the end of the fifth year, they would be meeting those three, the three weeks or the 15 days vacation. Quick, quick question. Uh, so, for people within that fall within the twelve month secretarial staff who have been here for longer than one, that they've been here for say three years, for example, would they get the additional days? Do you know what I mean? Would they go to two, would they go two to weeks in one day, days? or would they go to exactly? Yes. Thank you. That's what we would do. We okay. would count them to thirteen days. to lump them up for the yeah. time they've already put in. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I should have asked this of you. Uh, Perhaps giving you more time, uh, but wondering how how many secretarial staff do we have in the district? Someone makes me think that the number is twelve that would fall under this, into this category. So separate from the ones that are just during the school year is what you I mean. With there are twelve that are full time, like year round, as opposed right. to the 12, 12 month secretaries. Okay, so those are the ones who get impacted by this. Correct. Or the ones who are five years or fewer. fewer. Right. The ones who are yes. five years and more already have their three weeks. So it's, okay. it's, it's, it's a small a number. Yes. Yeah. It's a small number. Yeah. Because in, in the schools, a lot of those secretaries have been here for many years. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Okay. So would you be able to kind of speak a little bit to any monetary impact? Obviously, we want to give folks time to relax mm -hmm. and um, get a break. So, well, we don't replace them like we would a teacher with a substitute, right? So, I mean, I guess it's sort of just loss of productivity. So I think, you know, we would have someone like the high school secretary, for example, or my secretary, Jen's secretary, they're all relatively new folks. So in that, you know, first year, whatever the value is of a single day's work for one of those people, that's what it's technically costing the district, the productivity of that dollar amount. Though arguably, after one year, they can do more with their time. <laughs> time, you know what I mean? They're more yeah, productive, so more productive. productive. Yeah. And okay. in defense of the secretaries, I mean, I can't tell you how frequently we get emails I mean, long after the 3.30, 4.30, whatever their right. time frame is for going home. They are responding. always responding. Well, they're yes. salaried, right? The, the hourly. Yeah, they actually have an hourly oh. rate. Yeah. It's somewhere in like the middle 20s, around $25 an hour. I guess it's one of those jobs which just remains, even if you're taking a day off. Correct. Yes. Other comments, questions? No, makes sense. Hearing none, I will seek a motion to approve the amended vacation time for 12 months secretary of staff. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. Okay, it's unanimous and so carries, and we have already discussed the culture and diversity survey. So we will move on to future agenda items, and I just want to start before we move into new future agenda items to kind of recap some of the ones that we had discussed in our June meeting, because while they haven't all popped up on the agenda, they have not disappeared from my um, consideration. So the, the ethics policy um, that had been brought up in that it was referred back to the policy um, planning subcommittee. Mm -hmm. uh, the diversity and racial equity um, requires further, we discussed, requires further discussion before bringing here because there are many different prongs that we want to do and I know that the two of you um, have taken a step and there will be 
other stuff I think also makes sense as we move into the fall and people are more in tune with what we're doing to launch a larger initiative. Then the reorganization meeting that, that had been brought up discussing the policy level also is on your policy radar. Uh, then communication, we discussed, uh, we have had some discussion about that. Uh, we talked about doing the office hours, we're talking about doing a newsletter. We also want to do an audit, I think, of some of the stuff we're already doing was the intent of that. So that is not that is not gone from that either. Uh, the other one was differentiation in the classroom. We have not gotten to that yet, but that is a piece that um, I know that Nina, you are going to have some discussion with Carol about, and maybe the two of you can figure out how that makes sense for our committee to move forward with. Then uh, school committee orientation is on our agenda for later today. The school committee operational goals for the year, um, that is something that has had some, I know, some discussion uh, with you and we'll continue, I know, as part of what we're doing on a larger group. Uh, and then are there other items that we want to add to our ticker to try to, uh, other things that people want to bring forward uh, at future meetings that we have not either previously discussed that we want to bring forward or that have not somehow become Oh, in our collective consciousness. So, it, yeah, I never want to disappoint you. <laughs> uh, never do. <laughs> so, uh, you know, last couple of meetings ago, Ashok had uh, presented on the technology front and he had talked about the Chromebooks and a bunch of other things. And we had talked about, you know, we would want to hear how is it that technology, all this investment in technology is helping children. Right, so not so much about these Chromebook, the technical details of it, but how is all of this money and all of this investment ultimately helping our kids learn? What are they doing with this technology that we have placed in their hands? Exactly. That's what we were looking to understand, so a presentation on that would be fantastic. So I'm very curious about the use of technology with five and six year olds and what's going on with that and we need to talk about how you know providing them with access to these implements might be feeding an addiction I've actually uh, you know I've heard um, I had to take my son to a uh, optometrist because he has gotten his glasses and she said I wish there were no um, iPads in elementary grades she said they should be having sunshine they should be out more Right. And I loved hearing that from a doctor, an optometrist, you know, an ophthalmologist. Okay. Sure. So, so yeah. to avoid the risk of deliberating Sorry. here, I am going to add this to the list uh, and we can figure <coughs> out um, how the best person or people to report back in, in what form that would be for, mm -hmm. for us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. and then in that case, we will move on to old business, school committee policy, BIA, new school committee member orientation for a third reading. And I will ask um, Nina if you want to... Oh, have we missed poli school committee policy review? Did I skip over that? I did. I am so sorry. You know what happened is I moved... I skipped over the... Let, let me backtrack. Let's go to the policy review discussion because I do want to make sure we hit that. I know we hit it all, but I know some people have to leave it all, so... All right, so we have been meeting, uh, Amanda, Jen, and I, and to be fair, Amanda put this together and did so very thoughtfully, and so I'm just going to call upon you. Oh. Are you fine with sure. sort of going through this? I mean, you've done such a nice job well, with it. We can I all chime it. in as appropriate. That's fine. Um, so we met twice. We will in the future be posting those meetings. Yes, <laughs> we will. <laughs> did not know. Um, we met twice to tackle the process of reviewing our policies. There are many, many policies, as you all know. Um, and our approach was, as you can see here, we started by going through all of our policies from the beginning to the end um, and referencing them against the MASC reference manual and other district policies that we're aware of. We tried to flag them preliminarily as either adopted, meaning they're okay, kind of as they are. Um, clerical for a minor, minor clerical update needed, review needed if we think there's questions or inconsistencies or proposed for new policies that we found that we think would be relevant such as the ethics policy. So we, um, we inserted some new, well, new ones to consider and then we sort of flagged them all. Um, we discussed an approach for how we would then prioritize the work because obviously we can't spend every 
school committee meeting reviewing every policy. It's, it's a big yes. amount of work for us to take on. Um, and what we want to do in a minute is share a, a schema or taxonomy for how we will prioritize and see if we all agree on the approach so that as we're prioritizing, we reflect the, what we all value as top priority and get to those first. Um, then we'll go through a second review, assign the appropriate priority level based on what we've come up with for a schema, come up with a calendar, and hopefully come back in August with a suggested calendar based on the priorities, and then get to the work of making the changes. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are so far. Um, as we approach this work, we just wanted to share a few sort of things that were lingering in the back of our minds as sort of guidelines. Um, these were not official, but there's they reflect the, um, the sort of the attitude of the, the subcommittee as you're looking at these. Each policy should, um, the purpose and content of each policy should be clear and should be reflected in the policy name. Again, going to transparency, if people are looking for something and the name is cryptic and that's what we're searching on, it's not going to help. Um, policy should not be written with hard-coded hard information that will likely change regularly, like the name of a, of a superintendent or a school committee person or name of an individual, more leave it as a title. Generally, I think we do a good job of this. There are a few cases where we have some clerical updates to make. School committee policy and procedure website should include all the policies and related procedures and forms and have a standard numbering scheme. What we found is that we have a mixed collection. Uh, we have all the policies. In some cases, we have the procedures that go along with them. In some cases, they exist, but they're not on our website. Um, in some cases we have forms, in some cases they exist but they're elsewhere. In some cases they're, they're named um, with a policy number and then a dash one, sometimes it's E1, sometimes it's R1, we're not sure why. So a future to do of the subcommittee is to standardize. Uh, the policy numbers will stay but the related documentation will have a logical numbering that's consistent. And that's our goal that we will share. Policy should reflect core values of the district. So if there's something that is really, really important to us, diversity, for example, um, it's more specifically socioeconomic diversity or something like that, that does not crop up in our policies, um, we need to take another look. Because if it's not in our policies, we feel that the school committee then can't really weigh in. I mean, the, the policies represent the things that we can then weigh in on and hold the district accountable to and that we can all work toward. So knowing our core values and kind of making sure they're reflected was something we had in mind. Um, there should be an official source copy of, of all the policies that is identified and secured. It could be digital, it could be hard copy, and then we, we say now that it's what you reference online, but online is different if you reference from one page or another page that online is um, hard to, to, to nail down right now because mm -hmm. we don't have everything updated. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to fix that. And policy should include a mechanism for understanding and periodically reviewing policy effectiveness from the viewpoint of all stakeholders. This is something that's going to, going to require more work because in some cases it's sort of a value judgment and the superintendent will come forward and say, hey, you know, in practice this policy is not working and then we review it. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's not data, but we just see that it's broken. Mm -hmm. In some cases, policies can be reviewed with data, but we haven't actually officially said for the policies how do we know if it's working? And how do we know if it's working from a community perspective, like a parent perspective, as well as a staff and uh, administrative perspective? So um, sort of an ongoing conversation for the subcommittee is going to be to circle back and look at um, how we know effectiveness is, is there, how we determine that. And I, I, I don't know if you've been on the subcommittee in the past, other people have as well. I don't know if we've done this officially, but it is one of our policies that school committee evaluates effectiveness of policy. But we don't really know how we do that. So anyway, so that was our kind of our guiding set of, at least a subset of what was guiding our work. And then the next slide. Oh, this, no, is wait, I, this is the next one. Oh, sorry. Um, right. So then we came up with a, a, how are we going to prioritize all these policies? There, Like I said, there are tons of them. We went through them all and flagged them. But if we have 15 of them that have under review, which one comes first? So, of course, maybe it seems obvious, first and foremost, if it violates a current law or a recommended best practice or a newly set precedent, um, it needs to be reviewed immediately. I don't think we have a lot of those, but um, that's the first, obviously we have to be in compliance. 
Secondly, if it does not reflect a practice or that we're currently doing, or must be or either the policy must be changed or the practice must, must be changed. If we're out of alignment, I think that's true in a couple of cases, and so we'll come back to those. Um, third case, if it's deemed operationally insufficient by the superintendent, the staff, or the community, if there's some a policy that's been flagged as not working, that will bump up because it's, it seems broken. To some one stakeholder, at least, it seems broken. Fourth, um, if the policy doesn't accurately reflect our current values or priorities, um, we'll get to, we'll come to that. Um, sort of one to three kind of are broken, need to be fixed. Four to seven are more um, prioritizing, it's more of a judgment or value mm -hmm. uh, associated. So number five, the absence of the policy would leave the school committee or the district exposed to future issues or, or maybe um, make things unnecessarily um, complicated. So in that case, we might want to add a policy. Number six, the policy is outdated, um, generally accurate, but we need to make clerical changes. Those may happen in parallel. If it's just a minor clerical change, we don't have to wait for a big discussion. And um, lastly, if we think there's a policy or a change that would add clarity or completeness, it's not really required, but we think it would enhance the, the body of policies that we have, that would come as a, as a lower priority. And in addition to MASC, as we were going through it, we would look at other districts' policies when we became curious about one. Yeah. So there are some yeah. really good policies out there yes. that right. could be borrowed. Yeah. Pirated. 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 Oh, no, pirated. Uh, this is really excellent uh, to have this codified like this to, of how we're going to approach, because it, it is a tremendous amount of stuff to go through for all of yeah. us individually. And mm -hmm. I just so appreciate both of you have this, this is definitely so Amanda's hard. brain at work, and well, I have to give her credit where credit is due because I, she I had a really good way of sort of structuring it. Yeah. This is a big part of the beauty of keeping one and dropping one off and bringing a fresh person in is you bring a whole fresh new perspective. You brought a whole fresh new perspective yeah. last year. I really feel like we can make some really substantial improvement over this year based on all this, so well done, all three of you. And this is, this is extremely work. helpful mm -hmm. to see the thought process you're mm -hmm. sharing, you know, you're talking about the priorities and all of that, so extremely good, and I'm thinking you went through a ton of stuff to get Just here. to read all the policies. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 It was just a little over three hours time, but we made very good time and got through a lot of policy. Yeah, I thought. It's very good. I'm going to guess you read on the outside. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you read, you read, you read on the outside. You can't read all those three hours. It sounds a lot more than that. Unless you're speaking. No share Google Docs. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the first question is, it, it, does the priority order seem to reflect the, what you, we would all agree is the top priority and so forth. With the exception that the clerical errors or um, corrections, updates, for example, numbering, if we change them, mm -hmm. if we standardize the numbering, I don't know that that needs a whole lot of d debate. Right. Um, right. Or if we update Those can be slipped in here and there I without think it's disrupting the flow. Right, yeah. I right. think one of them was um, Dr. Kavanaugh is the assistant superintendent still in a hard-coded piece of information. So right. I mean, that's a clerical update. Um, so with that exception to the others on the previous slide, is a priority order, does it work? I yeah, think absolutely. so, absolutely. This is fantastic. Yeah. Great. And appreciate the update and all of this, that it is nice to see the, you guys have made a lot of progress. Yes, so, and as a subcommittee, we have to thank you. Mm -hmm. you, you really did a nice job. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, we have a snazzy spreadsheet. To see that. So, <laughs> so the next steps for us would be, um, now that we kind of all agree on how we're going to prioritize and get to work. We'll go through the flagged um, policies and assign them a priority level based on what we just said so that we can then um, pull those out. Then we'll develop a calendar for reviewing. Um, I guess a question we haven't talked about is what is like a, do we need like a target number, like is it one or two at a time we review? I mean, what, are, what guideline do we use for how we space I think it depends on how long each one is anticipated right. to take. Right. Okay. It was and like an educated guess of what it, the discussion yes. would entail. You know, and you know, often a third reading, for example, of a policy we know is not going to take as much time because we've seen what happened in the second and the first reading. Yeah. Okay. First reading, all bets could be off because it could catch somebody's eye in the community that does not like the direction we're going with it, and that. Right. Yeah. 
we want to be aware of. Or it says ADA and, and everybody well, thinks it's about one thing that, and in fact right. it's about another thing. That right? was a great example yes. of a policy that was not coded well that yeah. when right. you see a policy that's named ADA and it has nothing to do with disability, mm -hmm. yeah. right. it's very confusing. It is really tricky, as you know, I mean the, the, the letters are given to us. Yes, from NAAC. So yeah. It's getting them the name to be really clear because yeah. the letters are yes. there. And we mm -hmm. don't necessarily have to show the letter. It could be just the name. I mean, the letters can be just deceiving. But So we'll come up with a calendar, a, a straw proposal that we'll hopefully get back on the 13th if we have an opportunity to meet and get it done. Um, then we will, you know, as an ongoing basis, as soon as possible, make any clerical changes that are, are quick and easy. Um, and based on the calendar, we'll work the major policy changes with the group. Um, and um, the effectiveness evaluation at last bucket is sort of it's, it's another conversation that we're going to keep ongoing so that we can maybe get some, some more um, specificity around how we evaluate each policy and whether it's effective or not. Yeah, I actually really like your last step to, you know, figuring out what's that evaluation mechanism to see all our policies are actually effective. Great. Well done, Excellent. yes. Yeah. We did a lot of conversation around how do we know that they're effective. Right. And we still don't know how we know yeah. that they're effective, no, but we know that we need to know. Right. Yes. And I imagine for different policies, understanding whether or not it's effective would be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Right. Quite a bit. Yeah. Sometimes it's, it's like right. anecdotal almost, you know, based right. on what is experienced in, you know, in the trenches. And sometimes there is data yeah, that, that should be data. looked at. Yeah. And so it's just a matter of looking at them and figuring that out. That's great. Um, okay. So there, there is nothing you need from us right now, then? Just the acceptance just of the priority scheme. Okay. Would we like a motion for that? Would you like sure. a formal acceptance? Yeah, um, so I would seek a motion then to accept the um, priorities in the work presented by the subcommittee. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Yes. Uh, yes. And it was unanimous. And mm -hmm. so. We bless, bless you to charge on. Okay. Um, that moves us then into old business school committee policy BIA, new school committee member orientation. And I will pass that over to me. Thank you. Um, so with regard to the policy where we had left out last time, uh, you know, this was just before the election and the um, new board was going to come on, um, on road. We looked at the policy and we added a few documents that we wanted to put in. But what we also left off saying is that maybe we need an orientation manual. And I was thinking about uh, the fact that we do have a ton of documents, right, that you get to review, whether it be policies, whether it be MACs, resources, or the laws, and a bunch of other things, and you know the contracts, etc. So. I kept thinking about my own experience, um, also reflecting on that a little bit. And I thought, um, so look at a proposal, you know, put together a proposal to see if we can create a two-day orientation for new school committee members. Uh, we have done a tour for our superintendent candidates, and I learned so much from that process just reviewing, uh, going around, just understanding what are some of the offerings, etc. It made a lot of sense to me. So this is coming a little bit from that proposal. If you don't mind, uh, Dr. Kavna. Uh, I mean, you know, the first time you come on board, you're expected to vote on a multitude of things, and it's complex. You know, that decision making, uh, you know, you're asked to sign off on a million dollars something and how do you understand that and how do you feel comfortable that you are doing the right thing and in order to do that you need to have the basic information available to you and you you have to do this you know right after you take oath um, so that there's that's one aspect the second aspect uh, I think we talked about it earlier in the meeting is the way we are set up is you pretty much have to insert yourself into understanding. You know, you are in a committee, you go to those committees, and that's how you understand what's going on. I feel like maybe we need to reach out to the new school committee members and say, you're welcome into the process, and come understand how we work, so you can make a better informed decision. Um, and just welcome to the process. That's how I was thinking of it. Um, and that has been the experience uh, for most of us, but I think there are those moments when 
a lot of us have been around for a bit and not been around that long, but uh, you know, you're in the flow and you miss the perspective of someone who's just come in. So that's, that's where it was coming from. Um, so again, a goal driven view that, you know, we focused on, I know we have to change the student achievement to perhaps educational welfare. Uh, but those are the things that are guiding some of our work from the school committee perspective, the budget, the policy, and there are a couple more for the down. So what would help for us to uh, get a good understanding? Um, I thought perhaps the offering of, uh, you know, what, what is the district offerings in, you know, K through 12? What is it that we offer? Um, perhaps some statistics on how our students are doing. Overview of, overview of issues impacting student learning and achievement. Having some understanding of that would help. From a budget perspective, I was, uh, you know, especially once we get into the budget session, we talk about pay as you go. We, we talk about capital items. I learned all of that in my personal experience, but it would help to have almost a municipal finance 101, if you will, because we're making those decisions, right? And of course we rely on expertise, but it helps to have a, you know, at least an overview. And perhaps that's something we partner um, you know, with, with our finance director, or maybe our town also offers something like this to their employees, so something to look at. Um, also overview of how the budget is developed. We can look at our current um, year's budget. How was that developed? We always talk about developing it ground up. And um, any uh, ongoing capital projects. And in terms of policies, just trying to understand, of course you have a bunch of policies that you can read through, but you know, what is the structure? How do you develop a new policy? That's something that would be helpful to a new member, I think, uh, if you don't mind. And then of course, um, you know, these are the other things which are on, on, upper, on upper view, the superintendent, of course, and trying to understand what are the superintendent's goals for the year? So someone who has come in brand new, in this case it's all going to be brand new, but uh, you know, if you've been around for a bit, you do want to understand that how is the performance review process? What are the challenges that the superintendent is facing? And how is it that we can support, you know, trying to understand and assess that a little bit. And of course on the operations end, I think the norms help, right, to talk about the school committee meetings. What are the types of school committee meetings? We don't, you know, there are things that you can understand as you go, but there are some things which would help that you know ahead of time, maybe you refer back to it as you move through. What's a regular meeting? What's an executive meeting? When do we have a special meeting? Um, how do you add an agenda item? And how you have to prepare for it before it's presented? I mean, these are things that I learned on the go. Um, nothing wrong with that, but I think it just helps to know it beforehand subcommittees, I know we talked about that a little bit today, yeah. other aspects, you know, legal, HR, there are a bunch of things that we can go. I feel like that's the gamut that we are talking about in terms of the understanding that's needed to do that first vote um, when we go to the school committee meeting. So the, the request or the proposal is perhaps we have a two-day uh, present, you know, uh, orientation program, if you will, and we need to figure out the timing of it. Um, I think it's a busy time of the year when people come on board. At the same time, we know that that's going to happen almost every year. Um, I don't know if we will have a new member every year necessarily, but it does happen around that time, and it's a busy time, and you know, it's graduation time, it's early spring, and what have you. So. I do want us to think a little bit about the timing. I was thinking it should happen as soon as possible, um, but but we can look at that. And I'll, I'll take your input in a minute, but if you go to the next slide, this is what I was um, suggesting, that perhaps we can start with the chair, or you know, if the chair has um, left that year and all new members are there, um, there is an invite from the school chair to speak to how does the school committee function? Give an overview, maybe an hour, about how we all function, the things that, some of the norms that we talked about. Perhaps the superintendent invites the new school committee members and shares what, what does the day look like for the superintendent and through that course, speak to the challenges, what are the goals, etc. Um, the finance director, she had given me time too when I had come on board, you know, understanding the budget. 
what are the major projects that we have going at the moment. Um, uh, the student services director understanding the diverse needs, the special needs, if you will. Um, and this is something else that I threw out there that maybe we have um, an opportunity for the school committee members to get to know a few teachers and students and hear directly from them, you know, how is, how's their experience been. Again, it's just a proposal at this point in time. Um, so it's what about four, five and a half hours. Um, and if you look at the second day, um, perhaps meet all the principals and get a tour of the school, understand the offerings, look at the challenges, any projects, anything that's exciting them, speak and invite and get to know the new school committee members. And, um, and finally, after all of that is done, perhaps a closure with the school committee chair to speak to any additional questions and follow up meetings that may be needed. So this is uh, just a thought and a proposal that, that might help your school committee members. So looking for feedback on uh, the proposal and timing, anything. Uh -huh. it, it's a lot of good information. So it, just to, I, I want to be clear on the discussion. Are we discussing this in addition to doing an orientation manual or in lieu of a manual and then people bring that are presenting to new school committee members bring things as relevant to their discussion or so what? my proposal right now with the policy is that in the policy let's get a closure to the policy with yes. the items that we have yes. including the school improvement plans the strategic plans but add in there that the school committee members get an orientation or have gone through an orientation program with the district leaders and the school committee chair if you will I was hoping to include that in the policy and close that, if everyone's okay with it. And we can tweak this and we can work on the timing, um, but like I said, it really helped to go through that uh, the, when the superintendent candidates came to go sure. through all of that. Because a lot of uh, folks who, you know, it's not a prerequisite when you run for the school committee to know, um, you know, the K through 12, right? Sure. It is not necessary that your kids have gone through it all great. So when your kids go through the schools, you get to know a lot more about that particular school building, function, offerings, etc. But when you have kids in the elementary, you don't necessarily know everything about the high school. But the first thing on the agenda item is to approve something. Yes, I trust the high school principal, but it's my job that has been entrusted on me by the community to have the oversight and my vote matters along with, I would love to trust my colleagues but I need to do my job right. So it's, that's what absolutely I'm everybody needs to know what they're voting. That you should, we we not you, but we should always understand what it is that we're voting for or not voting for. Right. And I did get all of this j just to be clear. But I reached out um, to set up those meetings, and I just feel that any new member that's coming in should be given this. Um, so. I have a couple. I like this idea of having some type of orientation, um, but I think you might need to leave it as an optional, as opposed to yes. required in the policy, for a couple reasons. Um, the first being that many folks who work, do work on the school committee, may not have the flexibility to get into the schools during the day. Um, so I think it could be tricky and almost. Um, it could be a, a sort of a, a, I don't know what the right word is, but someone might not be able to do it because of their full-time job. And that would be sort of um, discriminatory to someone who's working full-time mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing that I think is tricky is that I would, I know that any of the principals would gladly give their time to a new school committee member, um, but I wouldn't want to put it in policy and require them to do it. Because I don't necessarily think that's their job so much as it, it would be something they would gladly do in order to welcome someone into the community. Um, and then I think, you know, like what you said, if somebody is going to take on this role, my hope would be that he or she proactively reaches out to the folks that 
are part of the community, like what you did basically, because you, you did a good job. Like you came and you said, I need to find out information. I'm going to reach out and find these folks. So if we handed this to a new school committee member and said, here's what we recommend you do, I think that's awesome. But I think if we put it in policy and say, here's what you know policy dictates we do, then we might not be able to meet those requirements. So I don't, I mean, I think it's, I think if we handed this along with, you know, any other of the documents that are in the manual that you, you drafted, I think that would be excellent and say, we suggest you get in contact with these folks and set up a time to meet with all of these people. That would be great because maybe, you know, somebody coming on may not even realize that there is, you know, Hopefully they know there's a finance director, but you know, maybe not, maybe depending on the member of the community. Yeah, they may not realize that there's someone specifically in charge of that. You know, so I think, um, you know, I love this, but I worry about putting in policy. So I, I, I'm not proposing that we put this in the policy, but the fact that they must go through an orientation and this must be available. To give you a, um, you know, I hear what you're saying about, you know, maybe it has to be flexible, maybe it's spread over four days based on your availability, right? I actually requested, this is, um, you know, I don't know, I'm going to say it out loud. I requested that I get an overview of the high school and the middle school. I did not receive it. So I don't want anyone else to have to face that. So having some kind of a structure around it would help. When you say overview, what do you mean? Um, you know, just understanding what are the offerings that happen. Maybe look at a tour, go through a tour of uh, uh, the facility, right? Um, having an understanding of that, if you're talking about clubs, I only have kids in the elementary. I've come on board, I'm expected to vote on things. It's only fair that I understand how the clubs function. You're asking that a stipend be moved from here to there, right? If I don't even understand how all of that functions, I don't think it's fair um, that I'd be expected to vote. Sure, I can reach out to a parent or community member and try to understand that. But I'm working here in an in a, um, official capacity, if you will, in a public capacity. I think it's only fair that you get that option. And maybe, maybe it is left to the individuals that they choose not to do some because they got it. That's fine. So I agree with you on the optional part of it, but not having that option is, is what I'm expecting. Uh, we work on. It, it should not be that a new school committee member learns about the schools through a tour for an external superintendent who has come for an interview. I am against that. I would just be careful to not expect that we could do it all in one day. Oh, that's fair. Right? Because, that's fair. you know, I, I if hear you. Evan Bishop is out of the district at PD, that could mix up. I, I understand. I completely understand. And I don't think this would happen. This is a once a year thing right. that is going to happen. And maybe sometimes it won't happen. You know, people get reelected. So it's maybe a once a year, maybe it's twice a year, maybe it's once in five years. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but I, I hear what you're saying. Maybe it's a checklist that, you know, and so everybody should have that option. They may choose to use it or not use it, but that option must be available. So I think these are all really excellent things to make available for new school committee members and to make it readily available so that it's not hard to track down, particularly, I mean, not particularly, but when there's more than one school committee member, it is easy to tag, to have two go along with it. It may not be always possible to oriented in a, a day one, day two, but I, I don't think that's exactly how you intended the, it has to be. Mm -hmm. Right. But right. As, soon as, it, as soon as feasible to get this information to people. I'm wondering if there's a way we can, because I also agree with Jen that there are some who may not want to avail themselves of this, and that's whether they've you know worked in the district or they have extensive experience and they know what it is, that's, that's okay as well but the, there should be information available. I'm wondering if we could house the list in there somehow and make it the responsibility of the superintendent and the school committee chair jointly to provide an orientation. 
I think that sounds good, Nancy. And I feel again, you know, it's back to feeling welcomed. And that's I, I and think orienting. And I think that when you leave it to folks to have to figure it out, um, that's where I think um, we're moving away a little bit from there to kind of say, here are your options. I think the welcome should always be extended. I think that it's great to kind of put that as is a practice of what we're doing. At the very least, um, people should be provided with, with the information and the names and the how to reach people if it's not possible to orient people right. in a day-to-day -day basis. I, I guess I'm look, gonna look to you and not to put you on the spot, yeah. but to think if there are, there are other pieces that you feel like you needed but you didn't have access to or what what else would have been important yeah um, I, I really I like I, I love this I think you've hit on like, this, yeah. you know so much obviously so much of the job and you've, you've covered it in a really organized way and I like the um, the other slides with the boxes of you know like the white yeah, I can go the, up a bit. Of the school committee job. The like yeah, they get that when they run. Yeah. 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 With the administrative staff before you're asked to go vote on some like spending of money right. that you don't even know like how to spell like chart of accounts and like you're wondering what you're doing. I think the administrative this administrative side is difficult to get elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I think you can kind of watch meetings and you can glean a lot of this, but it's very difficult to really be oriented in this. So I love day one as an orientation. Um, I'm wondering if when people pull papers, because this happens coincidentally right around the time that we then hear all the school improvement plans, we have all of the principals coming to school committee between the day you pull papers and the election, pretty much. And I'm just wondering if we could have a one page sort of heads up sheet for people who pull papers to say, you know, thank you so much for considering joining school committee. Um, the spring is a really busy time in the school calendar, and here are some things you might want to be aware of to help orient you to the broader district. And so that when you're, you're, you're kind of hitting, when you pull papers, you could be alerted to budget timeline if you weren't already aware. I mean, hopefully you're doing some work to dig into this as a candidate, but it's hard to do it all. And, it, you know, we don't want to, definitely don't want to dissuade people from running. So if we can actually say, Thank you so much for running. Um, right. it, during the spring, please keep an eye out for the school improvement plan meetings. Come to the school committee, hear the principals present their priorities. Because they're already coming forward. I'm wondering if we can ha encourage candidates to sit in the audience and actually take it in on specific dates in particular. I do like the idea of moving some of this to, you know, sort of that post five o'clock because I think about people who have a nine to five job. Like mm -hmm. we just voted on vacation days mm -hmm. for our secretarial staff, right? I mean, if we limited this to regular daytime hours, I would never want to see someone using a vacation day to do this, right? right? No, so, right, right. You know, I mean, I think if we are thinking about our changing demography, like I would love to have somebody who is working nine to five be a school committee member. Sure. And we shouldn't sort of preclude their candidacy because we're only here from eight to three. Right. right. So one of the things that I was thinking about when I was putting this together is some of this can be recorded. You know, it could be a video. It's, you know, yes. you know Mr. Bishop could do a video and um, mm -hmm. that's accessible. And then if you have any further questions based on your availability, you yeah. can go join. Mm -hmm. So folks who have, you know, difficult timelines, you know, the day-to-day -day jobs, both on the school committee front as well as the billing um, leaders, and not to say you're not super busy, you all are super busy as well. Uh, but if there are constraints around that, and if a video could be made available, I, I think that works too. Uh, but again, this should be an offering we go out of our way yeah. to offer, rather than waiting for folks to ask for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can all think about it. I'm, I'm okay if... Uh, well, I think there are multiple ways we could put this information out to yeah. people, yeah. right? Also of um, the idea of giving some of this information to candidates when they pull mm -hmm. papers, they pull papers it, it could be because right. we can mm -hmm. see who's pulled papers as they pull papers to include them because mm -hmm. they're likely 
they have a chance of however many people you know want okay. however like many maybe only two people them. are running for two seats that does happen from time to time um <laughs> but to to front load it a little ahead of even when they start on i like how you have included also uh the school committee acting chair because there is an awkward period of time between when the election takes place and when a new chair has taken place and as was the case this year our chair from last year cycled off the committee and I it, it was an awkward it, it, it is spelled out in mass general laws how the succession would go that the vice chair acts in the capacity of chair but it's nice to put it out there so people understand that I'm not over whoever it is is not overreaching and being pushy but trying to be helpful right um, and you know we also have the year that Jen and I joined, right. um, when we didn't have either the chair or the vice chair for a period of time. I think so. So both Kelly Knight and Laura yeah, Baker yes, said that. Right. So in however, that case, it's Jean should have been however, the Jean, senior Jean ranking member. Jean didn't do that, and and you know that she was, would have that been was the amazing. acting. She would have yes. been the acting chair because she was the senior ranking member. That's right. She, like I said, she was extremely helpful in walking through how we function, etc. So. Um, I like that this is um, district specific, which is very different from what you get at the MASC training, yes. which is also excellent training yes. and, and is required, as you know. So I like this. I mean, like you, I personally like pulled a bunch of data as I was running and I was, you know, on the right. well, you know, you're, you're educating yeah. yourself, hopefully, as a candidate, but again, you know, I still, still love to sit with you. I mean, still, there's still sure. things that I need to figure out. And I think the administrative piece, student services is another piece that people might not intersect unless they have a reason right. to as a parent. Uh, so. and, and building tours, I and, think, are a nice, yeah. if and, you haven't and, had a child. Yes, yeah, so and there are a bunch of other things, and I, uh, and I shouldn't say, uh, you know, I know I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, however, I do want to say that I got an excellent tour of the buildings and grounds. The athletics director spent time. Um, likewise, um, I, uh, I did not spend time, but that's another area that keeps coming to the school committee is the music department and the arts wow. department. Mm -hmm. Just understanding their offerings, and maybe that can happen through the uh, building leaders. But again, those are things that will keep coming to us. You will see that you'll have to vote on. Um, and, you know, Amanda, I see you more as someone who's been so involved in the community and understands, and your children have gone through the school district with their, you know, with the changing demography. Uh, there are lots of new people who haven't been through the system. And I mean, even if your kids have gone through, but now the kindergarten the whole curriculum mm -hmm. is still different. Right. I mean, it changes. It changes. Yeah, it does. Right. Right. 12 years. So right. for the, the purpose of the policy itself, um, I, I look at this and I, it, it speaks to me more as a procedural piece that is important and needs to be in its own piece but I also feel like we may get to we may get to another year from now and we may feel like oh we want to add this or subtract or shift around That's right. That's right. and if we leave the actual specifics of it as part of a procedure we have the ability to not have to open up the entire policy in order to revise what we think is important. That's fair Nancy and what I was hoping is if we can ask our add something uh, related to uh, in-person welcoming orientation program or something to that effect um, led by the chair and the superintendent will be provided something to that effect i think that should be sufficient and all of these logistics you know the timing of it and making it as a checklist could be worked outside of it um, and people can choose make it optional that's absolutely fine so something to the effect and i want you i'm not trying to put words in your mouth, so please yeah. stop me if I change it, but some a sentence to the effect of the chair or acting chair and superintendent will offer an orientation to, a, a welcoming orientation to new school committee members upon their election. That sounds that, good. And then the, the actual specifics of it, does that, mm -hmm. and then that would be the, the chair at the time or the acting chair at the time and the superintendent who will hopefully be you for many, many years. Um, would figure out the specifics of how to structure time and make the connections with sure. different people. It makes great sense. And this is policy BIA, right? Yeah, this is policy BIA. Uh, and the other things that I, that if you pull, are you pulling it up on the district website? Is that yeah, what you're looking at? 
The, we had also added from the last reading the um, school improvement plans, correct? Yes, that's and right. And there was one other piece of information that's not in the original policy that we... Um, is I'll it the strategic plan? Why, why don't I do this? Um, so I have notes from the previous time, which I Excellent. can add. Um, I think there were some uh, comments that we had received, both from John and Jean. Um, there was one particular item that he had talked about if it was covered in that section, the MGL that is referenced. Okay, that's... Um, I can take a look, but that's already been voted on, right? So we did not vote on it. This, the policy in order to go, it, it requires, right. we, we were we waiting to figure out, we are waiting for our new members um, in part to be able to weigh that's in right. and then also just to have this discussion right here. And I think you've done fabulous work um, as usual. And I appreciate the time that you put into thinking about that. Um, You're welcome, yeah. Nancy. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if there is any further interest in an orientation manual um, besides this. Is this sufficient, or maybe is that something we look for next year? Because that's the direction we were thinking. That we is could, the direction we were thinking. We could take, and which would require everyone to put in information. Um, so. I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other, but I do think some of these things as a natural result of some of the work that we're doing will come out as things that should be given to, like each year, the school improvement plan, for example, or right. the, the things that we feel like new school committee members need, they will get from meeting with different people and whatever right. additional information. I'm also happy if people want to do a, an actual physical manual that I'm happy to to work on that in some way, shape, or form, or to sit back and vote like that on it. list of what? folks to contact. I think yeah. would be valuable to the new school committee member because it's got it yep. has it. Great, and we have to keep it updated, but it has names on it and contact right. information on it and titles, so that you can put at least names with buildings and, and sure. titles. So that that would mm -hmm. be great to keep it yeah. as part of a manual if you want yeah, to a checklist yeah you could just yes. a, uh, mm -hmm. convert this a little bit into the checklist right. what was in the presentation and if there are any other suggestions even from dr cavanaugh's perspective if she thinks something else might help um, to add we can add that to the checklist sure. what i was even thinking is when i was a new member one thing that would have been helpful is just like an outline of the year and in each month, kind yes. of what would you expect to be happening? Yes. So I know in our community, superintendent's evaluation came up and everybody was surprised. Oh, this is <laughs> happening now. Surprise. What does that mean? Or when does the budget season start and what is our involvement? So even something like that, when is school improvement plan season? What, what, okay. what, what right. events am I supposed to be at for high school, you know, grad, senior mm -hmm. week, things like yes. that. Right. So how right. right. that? Yeah. And yeah. then you could go to a colleague and say, what is this? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. That's, yeah, that's a fantastic point because I remember, you know, when someone asks, so what does it take? Is it just those meetings that you have on those <laughs> plans? <laughs> Which is what Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not throwing her under the bus or anything like that. All right, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So I think what you said makes absolute sense. Maybe that's another thing to share as, uh, you know, along with the calendar for the year, but to highlight a few areas where it will be heavy, like the budget mm -hmm. time. Yes. Um, Don't make social plans that month. <laughs> Those months. Right, right. Okay, so that, that sounds like a good idea to add into the checklist. Yeah. And perhaps also to be included would be there's a list of events that we are invited to attend mm -hmm. as a school committee that where our presence is, is, I think, requested because they like to have the weight of having another body, elected body there. So that, that would be good to include to people so that if they choose that they want to be there, they're aware that graduation is on X date and mm -hmm. eighth grade promotion is on whatever date. We got a list like that last year, I think. We did, we so we, maybe we need to update the list. It, it actually yeah. is good for everybody, yeah, have, not helpful. just the, really helpful. the new committee members. Yeah. So what I'm hearing then is that we want to bring this back one more time uh, to look at. Okay, is that, that's uh, fine. To, and just and we, we can, can clean up the language yes. then and mm -hmm. look to vote and then work on the piece and, and make sure there are new members, um, and Megan, Amanda, I don't need to not use your name, um, feel like you have had the opportunity to do all of the things and it's not just the next year's people that... Um, so I can, um, perhaps I can uh, bring this 
uh, make the amendments, look at the previous notes, and in all this we should be able to do it. I can create a checklist off of this, mm -hmm. and then take in all the inputs that received now, and if there are more, Beautiful. can be emailed through Dr. Kavanaugh. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, in that then brings us to our second opportunity for public comment, um, unless uh, we have members of the public hiding someplace, if people wish to speak as members of the public. Uh, and we, that then will move us to items by consensus. Okay. And again. So I recommend that the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined on your agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Four, four votes for yes, none for zero. That carries. And then uh, that brings us right up to if people really feel like they want to adjourn, <laughs> or we can find something else to do. So they have another hour, so. Mike's very available. <laughs> um, I would seek a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Yes. Yes, and so we are adjourned at 3.13 p.m. Our next meeting is August 13, 2018 at uh, 10 a.m. here in the conference room. Thank you and enjoy the summer.